I found a chaotic environment where tons of problems, tons of dynamic situations. I had to learn a lot really fast and I got 20 years of normal experience in five years because I was going out doing crazy things. I was uncomfortable every day. I was having to fire people that stood up in my wedding a couple of weeks before and they're crying in my arms. Welcome to the show. I am Kyle Matthews on the Matthews Mentality Podcast, where we dive into the mindset of the world's most driven founders, CEOs, business moguls, athletes, and entrepreneurs. Each episode will turn our guest wisdom into practical advice that will help you build a deeper understanding of what led them to success and the mentality behind what got them there. Let's get started. Welcome to the Matthews Mentality Podcast. Today, I'm here with Nick Huber. Nick is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and creator focused on real estate and small business. His entrepreneurial endeavors extend into various industries with each venture reflected in his commitment to innovation, growth, and making a meaningful impact. Nick oversees an extensive self-storage portfolio encompassing around 1.9 million square feet across 62 locations. That is a lot of property. Beyond, beyond his achievements in real estate, Nick is passionate about building communities of like-minded individuals. He's a prolific content creator. You, yeah, you could say that. Very prolific content creator, amassing a substantial online following through social media and podcasting, hosting two podcasts, The Sweaty Startup and The Nick Huber Show. With a relentless pursuit of excellence, Nick continues to leave an indelible mark on the business world. His forward-thinking approach, coupled with a commitment to sharing knowledge and fostering community, positions him as a leading figure in the entrepreneurial landscape. And with that, welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming down. So you you just drove down from Leopold, Indiana, yeah? Grew up there. Um, it's a 200-acre farm. I was hunting whitetail for about two weeks. How'd it go? It was amazing. Nothing better than waking up in the woods every morning for two weeks and as the, weather, the sun comes up. And it, was, it wasn't it uh, was too chilly, yeah? It's cold in the mornings, yeah. 35 when you're just sitting there for four hours straight, it'll, it'll chill you to the bone. And but. are you like in a deer blind or something? Uh, up in a stand, yeah. And so what do you bring in a stand? Do you bring a book? Do you bring... No, got my phone in case I fall out. Um, got my bow, got my grunt call, and I'm waiting for a deer to walk by. And just the voices in your head. That's right. Very cool. What is that? <laughs> so, but you... You grew up in Leopold. We're gonna we're gonna dive into how you ended mm -hmm. up here, but now you're you're heading down to Athens today, right? Yep. I uh, grew up in Southern Indiana. Went to school there. Mom was a school nurse. Dad was a VP of development for a, a hometown developer. It was pretty big. And uh, yeah, man, went went to school in Ithaca, New York, and ran track. Got out of track. Started my first company junior year um, at Cornell, and it was called Storage Squad. We moved boxes. I. Uh, was in a very bad business, a very hard business, but I learned a lot, solved a lot of problems. We had 200 plus part-time employees. I guess if you back up before that, I was in a, my dad put me on a lawnmower and gave me some commercial contracts through his developer when I was 13 years old. And that's when you realized what you didn't want to do with your life? <laughs> <laughs> Mowing lawns, you know, I liked it. My friends were making six seventy five at Subway in 2000, you know, 2003, whenever this was, and I was making 30, 40 bucks an hour mowing, mowing grass. And I realized real quick that, hey, uh, I like money. I'm motivated by money. Got it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that entire timeline as well as your uh, your your affinity for money. But what I mean, you have you have your hands in so many different things, and we're gonna do our best to unpack as much of that as possible today in the the 90 minutes or so we have. But what what does a typical day or week look like for you right now? I, entrepreneurship's unique, is and and I don't have a a set schedule. I'm starting to structure my content creation. We can talk a little bit about how I use that to fuel everything that I do. Mm -hmm. But I consider myself kind of like a opportunist opportunist. I, I'm a imagine a lion sitting on a rock. And a lot of times I'm sitting on the rock. A lot of times I'm sitting on the rock. And then when an opportunity comes, I will hop up and I'll work 80 hours a week for two or three weeks and get a lot done. And then I'll go back to adventuring with my kids, hunting, traveling. So there isn't a, a set routine week to week at this point. Yeah, I wake up a little bit before my kids do some writing, um, exercise, and then, yeah, wake up with my family, spend an hour or two with them, take them to school, go to my office in my basement and work. When you say writing, is are you like writing in a journal or are you talking writing on social media? Cause so all my content is shared across platforms. So I write my email newsletter every week. That's 1,000, 2,000 words. I spend a lot of time and energy on that. Uh, from that, we create a lot of tweets. We create a lot of LinkedIn posts. We create a lot of even longer form stuff for blogs. And I'm, and I'm writing a book right now as well that's going to come out in 2025. Oh. So. I'm just a writer. I love writing. I didn't know how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> yeah, that's what he started up with. Who's we? You said we. Who's we? I have a content team. So 
Um, I have a head of content. I have a video editor, audio editor, two admins, and uh, and then over on the holding company side, above my company sits two more admins, a, a web developer, and a and a head of ops. Uh, so, so you got a crew. Yeah. And what, where would, where where would you say are you spending most of your time today? Is it any one specific project? I think I'm spending is it social media. I mean, half my time is spent on my media company, which is writing, fine tuning my ideas, doing stuff like this, uh, building the online flywheel that is my media. The other half of the of my time is meeting with operators and chasing talent. So, uh, you know, and this is a this has been a long journey. Mm -hmm. You know, in the very beginning, I was working, doing, trading my time for money, just like most entrepreneurs start. Um, worked my way into hiring more people, managing more people, um, then getting very involved in my real estate business, which was 2017 to 2021. I was very involved in that company. And now it's, I'm chasing, I'm attracting talent, and I'm motivating them uh, as, as my core function at my businesses. So is that like, a, like an entrepreneur coach? I would say uh, I'm just overflowed with opportunity because of my media because of my social media presence it sounds so ridiculous to say this i'm just over overwhelmed with opportunity so people are reaching out hey i have this business opportunity i have that mm -hmm. and are they looking for co-investors are they looking for someone to coach them are looking for a partner yeah they, they're looking for partners they're looking to grow a company they're looking to you know maybe get off the venture capital uh you know rat rat race they want to start a real business that's proven in a in a proven business model and a you know my job is distribution at all my companies. So my job is to fill the hopper with potential customers and also attract the talent inside the business. Like in, in, in the operating agreement for these new companies that I'm starting, it says Nick is, Nick's job, fill the hopper with customers, take care of marketing, and be attract talent. If we need to make some key hires, I'm going to go out and find those people. And mostly through social media. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter is great because I can find customers. I can find investors. But it's super, super powerful because I can find people who know what they're doing, operators who have done it, they've hired, they've built teams. And when I get those people involved and into my companies, magic happens. Got it. Uh, we are going to spend time exploring how you got into social media because it's been such a big driver for you. But I want to start at the beginning. We, we touched on Leopold, Indiana. You grew up there. What was, what was your childhood, childhood like? Middle class. A uh, very poor county, Perry County, Indiana. Um, there were no G wagons in the parking lot. There were, you know, twenty year old Camrys and trucks. That's what, that's who we were. Um, Eighty three kids graduated with. It's, it's, it was the largest high school in my county, and um, I was the first one to ever go to the Ivy League because I ran track. I got into the Ivy League with a twenty four ACT, which is fiftieth percentile, um, because I was running track, which is very rare. So what what was your uh, what was your what do they call it? Um, your your event within track discipline, yeah, uh, decathlon. decathlon. So I, I decent at hurdles, high jump, strong four hundred meter runner, and uh, went there and learned pole vault, discus, shot put, javelin, and the others. Got it. So <laughs> and so you went and did the decathlon at Cornell. Yeah, and, and at the Ivy League championships, it's it's a weak conference relative to the SEC and ACC and things mm -hmm. like that in the Big Ten. So I was able to succeed at the four hundred. In, in the Ivy League, you know, run 48 flat and win an Ivy League championship my freshman year somehow. Um, but then I transitioned to decathlon where I was had more success and set the school record and was an All-American. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, did you have brothers and sisters growing up? Yeah. Uh, sisters two years younger, brothers six years younger. I was okay, the oldest. So you're the oldest. Yep. Of three. Of three. What did your parents do? Uh, mom was a school nurse. Dad was uh, started out as a construction manager, and then he took – sites soup to nuts of hey we need to build a nursing home in this zip code let's go find a let's go find a piece of property let's negotiate it let's entitle it let's hire um, all the contractors to get a you know 10 million dollar building built on that property and it was he he specialized in nursing homes specifically yeah he worked for a developer so i want to make that got clear he, okay. he wasn't an entrepreneur he got paid pretty well but he was never mm -hmm. you know on the principal side of owning the real estate were you exposed to any of that as a kid yeah i would travel around with him uh to these sites see what he did um like me, he's a he's a very charismatic leader. My dad could get people excited, and he could he he was very good at selling himself, selling his ideas, and making people buy into that. And that's what I got from do him. You, that's what you got from him. I was going to say, do you, do you think you got your I don't say love for real estate, but definitely an interest or or uh, your draw towards real estate um, in your career? 
from kind of being around real estate related projects? Massive. Yeah, it was massive. So he pushed me down entre- the entrepreneur path when I was 13 because... So he did. He did. He pushed me right down it. But he wasn't one. He was not an entrepreneur. But when he went to work uh, one day in 2003 or five or so- somewhere mm-hmm. around that range, and th- his boss said, yeah, the guy who mows all of our lawns here in town had a heart attack. He didn't die, but he's going to retire. We need to find somebody else to mow the lawns. And this is right in the middle of July in Indiana where it's really hot. Um, and my dad had the bright idea instead of going out and calling, you know, all, every, all the lawn care companies. He said, no, my son can do it. And I was 13, 13 years old. And uh, next thing I know, I'm on a zero turn radius mower. Is 60 or 72 inch? <laughs> it was smaller, 40 inch. But oh. Uh, I was in downtown mowing, and this is Tell City, Indiana, so not a, not a big town, but I was mowing uh, lawns in downtown Tell City, and I was paying my mom. He set me down at the counter and, just like this and said, this is how a profit and loss statement works. This is where you're going to rent the Very trucks. Cool. This, is, this is what you need to build to make money. And um, the first day out there, I cried. Um, it was miserable. I didn't want to be there. I wasn't emotionally mature enough. That was going to be my next question. Was it were you, you being such an entrepreneur now, was this just who you were at 13, or were you like, a normal 13-year-old no. you wanted to hang with your buddies. Yeah, it was – I didn't know to pick up the trash. So I mowed half the lawn, and pe- it was right next to a McDonald's. People throw the full bag of McDonald's in, in the yard. I didn't go around to pick up the trash, so the 200 pieces of trash that were in the yard became 200,000 pieces of smaller trash. Yeah. My dad drives back by, and he's like, oh, my God, no, stop. And he pulls me over, and I start – I just lose it, start crying, 13 years old. And he puts me in the truck, turns the air conditioning on, puts an ice towel around my neck and says, um, and I said, I quit. I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. And he said, okay, well, you're not allowed to quit till the end of the summer. You can't. Whether I have to help you, whatever, we're going to get through this and you can't quit. And that first day was maybe eight hours of work <laughs> for a 13-year-old. is absurd. Um, I don't know how I got through it. It felt like three days. And uh, then I got my first check. And I was That's addicted. That's when you were hooked. I was hooked. <laughs> I didn't what'd, quit. What did you do with your first check? I saved it. I, I, my mom's side of the family, Depression era, mm-hmm. you know, uh, my, my grandfather is a, a very frugal individual. And my mom's side of the family taught me that. I got... My dad's charisma with my mom's frugality. That's, that's a good combo. <laughs> yeah. Normally, charismatic people is kind of easy come, easy go. Yeah. Right? My dad's not afraid to spend money. He's wise with his money, but he's not afraid to spend it. My mom is afraid to spend money. Did, did your dad ever sit you down and say, hey, son, this is why you need to be in business for yourself? This is why you need to be an entrepreneur? Or was that just something? I just think he got excited. I'm just lucky that that day he got excited about setting me up. It was never think, oh, we are going to be entrepreneurs in this house. Mm-hmm. That was not a thing. Um, but when I started making those checks, I ended up getting tired of paying my mom ten dollars an hour to drive me to town. So I went to the high school uh, hallway and put flyers on in every locker that said, "Hey, I pay fifteen dollars an hour. Must have a license. Must have experience running a weed eater." And I hired a high schooler when I was thirteen to drive me to town. He would show up at my house, get in my truck that was fully outfitted, and drive to town. And we would mow together. And then I started making even more money because I was paying him fifteen, and we were getting you know seventy percent. I was still out working him, even though I was thirteen. Sure. But uh, yeah, it became a little business. And hiring that kid and solving problems when there's nobody around to solve a problem, yeah. your mower slides in a ditch, you got to pull it out with the truck, you got to cross four lanes of traffic on a mower when you're, when you're 13. Uh, parents don't do that for kids now, which is kind of a shame because, it is a shame. man, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's, I think a lot of that has to do with social media is because somewhere there is a kid who's crossing traffic on a mower and something bad happens and they write an article about it, and then it gets through the algorithms, pushed to every mom in America, and they click in, and they're like, my son's not going to do that. Yeah, not enough kids have jobs nowadays, I don't think. More of them should. I feel like youth sports, like what I call professional youth sports, like where these parents are drilling their kids. They, they, pick, they pick their kids' sports profession at seven. Like, mm-hmm. well, you're going to play baseball, mm-hmm. and they play year-round, and they get them all this private coaching. I feel like sports for kids has almost become their jobs. Like if you if you just look at the amount of time they're spending, as opposed to compared to me, who and you both went on to play a sport in a in a college in, in college, I played rec sports. It would be two three months, and then like there'd be a gap. There was there was no private coaching. There was no extra. Pra- you just show up. You do practice. You do the game. That was it. I, was that how it I was think, for you? Yeah, and I played three sports. Yeah, and when the season was over, I hung up my that's shoes, it. and that was it. And I, then I went on to the next sport. Yeah, and then in summer I did nothing. I mean, like, I, I was like a kid. I, I was outside, you know. Yeah. Um, now, now it's really hard to compete. Yeah. 
it's gonna. I, I worry if I don't do all that with my kids, I'm not gonna be able to compete. Which, if they can't compete, that's fine, I guess. But I'm not gonna. I don't think I'm gonna hype it, play the big hype machine on that is that is sports. We'll no, nah, it's uh, it's it's a man. It it tears parents. It tears parents and kids apart. Like I see um, some of these parents, they invest so much in their kid becoming good at a sport that when the kid just doesn't get to the level they want. Oftentimes, just because simply put, genetically, they just weren't built to, yeah, to hit, hit whatever that next level is. Yeah. Even the parents who try very hard to not show disappointment, the kids pick up on it, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's tough to see. That was one of again. I'm not here to I'm here to talk about you. But like one of the things, my dad he played pro football, but he never once ever made us play football, got us private coaching. He just like, look, you got to do something, just go full speed. That's all I care about. I think it's it, it's levels of discomfort and decision-making practice as a kid. Sports helps because you get beat up, you get knocked down, you lose, you get used to being yeah. uncomfortable, there's pressure. But my parents also made me make my, some of my own decisions as a very young kid, which parents don't do now. They, they shelter their kids, they put their kids in a bubble so that they make zero decisions. And then by the time these kids go off to college, They've never had any practice making decisions and never had uncomfortable situations because their parents and are fighting the every battle moment, for them. And in a few moments that the outcome wasn't what they wanted, they transferred schools, they argued for a better grade. They Blame the coach. They changed teams because they blamed the coach. It's, it, it very much is an issue. It's yeah. a, I wonder what the culture of this country will look like in 30, 40 years when this generation is – having gone through a full raise cycle of the next generation of kids. It's just because I think the principles and values aren't there. But again, I also tell myself that I think every generation says that about the next one, you know, and yeah, they figure it out. I think it'll be an advantage. I mean, I'm going to teach my kids how to work hard. I'm going to teach my kids how to make decisions. I'm going to show them about entrepreneurship and hard work, and they're going to have an advantage over the parents that aren't doing those things. Well, speaking of hardships, were there any hardships growing up? Yeah, yeah. I got bullied very badly. Um, maybe it's cause I was a good athlete and I came from a new school and, you know, I don't know how that kind of went down, but it, it, unhealthy environment from sixth grade to freshman year, probably. Um, and then, yeah, just doing my thing, trying to, trying to make it as a high school kid. And you grew up, you got bigger, got bigger, got faster. That always helps. <laughs> Started pulling girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that made the boys even matter though. Yeah. I was going to say that <laughs> sometimes that, that might not make them like you more. Um, so in high school, you're running track. When did you know you might have an opportunity to play sports in college? I got lucky, very lucky. Um, my dad also, being the excitable person that he is, he made a list of all the Ivy League schools, told me about them, and said, hey, look, this is the goal of sports, to get to one of these Ivy League schools. I took that list of Ivy League schools to my track coach and said, hey, Mr. Barnett, I would love to go to one of these schools. And he called all of them. Didn't have to. He cold good. called all of them. He cold called the Cornell coach once a month for three months. On the third month, he called the same day that one of their recruits, very late in the cycle, bailed, dropped out. Wow. And he picked up the phone and said, you know what? I got an extra spot now. It's too late in the recruiting cycle. It was December. Everybody else had already committed. Bring him in for a visit. I flew in the next week, visited, got into Cornell. Wow. Even though I was the slowest kid on the team. I ran What was this coach's name? Uh, Jason Barnett in Southern Indiana. And you ever... Is he still around? Still a great friend of mine. Um, hangs good. out on Twitter with me a little bit. Good and man. Yeah, he changed my life. Yeah, it sounds like it. Just got lucky. It, you know, that. I'm not going to say most coaches wouldn't do that, but most coaches wouldn't do that. I mean, no, they, absolutely I not. think most coaches want to help, um, and they're willing to go to some degree of, you know, of putting in the effort to get, but to cold call someone every month month after month or whatever that was i mean yep. it very much changed your life yeah and i owe a thank you to that kid who decommitted from cornell and went to florida and uh yeah here i am all right so you're at cornell what what was your mindset like at the time like when you showed up there were you like okay i'm at an ivy i'm gonna go full speed i'm gonna be a straight a student or were you still kind of i was just dumb enough to have the confidence that i could make it mm -hmm. i took all the easiest classes i had a great balance i, I socialized, I partied a little bit, I, got, I was serious enough about track to be competent, and I was just, in general, having a blast, building relationships, learning, you know, growing up, learning who I was, and uh, it was a phenomenal experience. I had a great group of guys. Did you, did, were you successful as a student right away, or did you have a semester or two where there was an adjustment? I got a couple Cs, never got a D. Um, yeah, it was great. 
was fine. Uh, and when you showed up there, did you know what you wanted your focus or major to be or no? No idea. I, I said, I like business. I want to be a business major. And the coach said, well, I don't have any spots on the, in the business. I can't get you in the, the business school at Cornell. Um, I can get you into ILR. And I said, I don't know what that stands for, but I'm in. I'll do it. It standard for industrial labor relations. It was training to be union leaders and uh, <laughs> HR professionals. Which is like the opposite <laughs> of everything you believe in. <laughs> no, the unions were great. I mean, when they when they came around the 30s, it was very important. They but. were great when they were when you needed a union because uh, there was like child labor law oh, issues. Yeah. And oh yeah, it did amazing yeah. things for members of my family. The unions were great. Uh, yeah, how I feel about them today is a little different. But no, I, that's my point. I mean, it's, uh, I was going to say, you as a union leader, I mean, you'd probably be very effective at it. I just, I, I know you well enough to know that's probably from a value and principle and like just overall like free market belief system. It's a little different. Oh yeah, I was in the most one of the most liberal branches of any school in the in the country, and I, it made me you know, more conservative almost. Yeah, in in a school and or a school system Ivy, that probably leans a little liberal to begin with. So you're in the leftmost part of the leftmost part of, yeah. of uh, the university system. Yeah, and I've always been one to question everything. And you came out a borderline libertarian free market capitalist. Yeah. Love it. Yep, exactly. Love it. That's what happened. Very funny. But uh, yeah, so junior year, I got an opportunity to start a moving and storage company, and I had had that uncomfort before. Yeah, tell, yeah, tell me about that. I had, I had been uncomfortable. I had hired somebody. I had done a couple things. And so when it came time to store and move boxes for my classmates when they why, were moving why, out. Why did you even think of that as the business? I listed my apartment on Craigslist. I was between houses, and you got to sign the summer lease for both anyway. Mm -hmm. So I had two places. Wasn't going to be there for either of them. Trying to lease them out on Craigslist. Um, nobody wanted to lease them because everybody leaves during the summer. You got a massive overflow of, of student housing. So a, a a kid's mom sent me an email and said, hey, I don't want to lease your apartment, but I want to store my son's stuff in there. And oh, by the way, can you come pick it up? So I drove up, worked my butt off for three hours, made 150 bucks cash, put it in the corner of the room. And I'm like, damn, I got a lot more room in here. Might as well store more stuff. So made a little signs. That our name at the time was University Storage. We hung them up all around campus. I hung them up all around campus. Went to, I was dating a girl in a sorority. This was junior year. Went to her meeting on Sunday morning and handed out flyers. Ended up getting about eight or 10 of her friends to store their stuff in my apartment. Before I knew it, my room was totally full. My other room was totally full. I had given a couple of my buddies 500 bucks for the summer, filled their rooms with stuff. And halfway through, I was like, man, I need even more room. So I went and met my business partner now, Dan, who was in the house I was moving into and said, hey, we need to use this basement. We got a basement here. We can fill this up with stuff. He had a big car. I had a big car. He had a Buick LeSabre 95. I had a 97 Cadillac DeVille that I'd bought from my grandma for two grand. And, uh, we drove around campus for four days straight, picking up stuff, um, worked a bunch, worked a bunch, but we had three grand sitting on the bed when we were done. And we're like, damn, that was kind of fun. Yeah. What I was thinking about, we were kind of touching on, um, how kids are being raised. So a student's mom called you, not the student said, I want to store my son's stuff and you need to come pick it up. I'll pay you $150 as opposed to making her son do it. Yep. yep. Right? Yeah. And then we realized there's a lot of college kids, especially at the exclusive, expensive schools, that aren't resourceful enough to pick up the phone and do any of this I'll, stuff. I'll ask about your mindset and mentality in a second at that moment. But, like, put yourself – like, what – what is your opinion on that? The mindset of a parent doing that for their kid. Oh, when I went to when I went to Cornell, it blew my mind. Um, I was a scrappy farm boy who ran a lawn care company, and there were kids on my floor whose both parents were attorneys. There was a G wagon parked in a, a parking lot outside, and they didn't know how to make any decisions ever. Because was, your parents made them all. We were going to go to a party in College Town. I'll vividly remember it. The guy in our suite mate next to us was like, "I'm coming too." I'm like, "All right, well." We're walking. He goes, it is way too cold to walk. And he calls his mom and says, hey, mom, it's 25. We're going to go to a party a mile away. Should we take a taxi? Is there any buses? Can you look up the bus schedule for me? Or should we walk? Called his mom to make that decision. And I'm like, these kids are different. This is, this is wild. Mm. And then I realized that these parents will put these kids in bubbles. And zero pain is allowed to touch their kid. And, and they're made to do a lot of work, but they're told exactly what to do. They have zero decision-making skills and decision making is a muscle you have to flex it to get better at it and they had never had any practice and this is why nowadays when they hear something they don't like they what do they call get triggered or words or violence or whatever it is is because they've never actually experienced 
any hardship is is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so ran around and got serious about this little business, got excited about it. It was a hard business, moving and storage business. We needed to buy boxes. We needed to deliver those boxes. We needed to pick up all the stuff. We needed to organize it in a warehouse. We needed to re-deliver it when the kids get back the next year to wherever they moved. And um, me and my business partner, Dan Hagberg, um, built that business over the next five years to do two and a half million a year of revenue with six full-time employees and uh, at our peak, almost 200 part-time employees that would drive trucks. We were in Boston, we were in Philadelphia, we were in Washington, D.C., big cities driving box trucks around. And, and that's what was where it called? It was called University. It's called Storage Squad. UniversityStorage.com was not available. StorageSquad.com was Storage available. Squad. So we, we named that company Storage Squad, sold that business in 2000, uh, end of 2020 for uh, 1.7 million bucks, which was, we had no, no debt or anything. So it was yeah, great. that's great. What, how, how would you assign credit to why when you had to figure out this problem, you had a problem, you had two leases, you didn't want to pay rent, right, for, for nothing. You're like, let me see if I could bring the cost of this down, subsidize or whatever. And you said, hey, there might be um, an opportunity here to make money. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of kids, let's call it that age in college, stumble across other opportunities, but they're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Like, mm-hmm. That's too hard. What? Our friends thought we were crazy. I mean, we bought a, a van on Craigslist for fifteen hundred bucks, an old nineteen ninety seven red, rusted on the sides cargo van. We bought it for fifteen hundred bucks, and we no, put our logo on the side. No and windows, looking like a criminal. Driving our friends, around town. our friends called that van a lot of bad yeah, things, <laughs> and uh, they're like, "Why are you guys doing this? We didn't come to the Ivy League, yeah, to to run a moving company. We came to the Ivy League to go get jobs at J.P. Morgan would, in New York City. Would you?" This is a hypothetical. Is it, Would you have done that if you had two rich parents who were attorneys and you're like, I don't need the money? I don't know. Yeah. I hope that my kids will do that. I was excited about oppor- the opportunity, the grind, the, the, the money. I was, it yeah. energized me when, if yeah, if I had dad's Amex and I could go out and get anything that I wanted, I don't know that it would have excited me to go out what and did, make. What did money mean to you at that point in your life? Money was scarce. I didn't have enough of it. I was uh, I was painfully cheap in high in college. Uh-huh. I wish I would have pitched in a little bit more to my buddies to like get a instead of drinking you know natty ice. Maybe we sh- should have spent two dollars more to get uh, Bush Light or something that we could play beer pong with easier. But I didn't have it was scarce. I didn't have any of it. I hoarded it. And uh, so like I, again, where money when you're 19, 20, 21, of course, because you're legally of age. Um, it did it mean you were, it allowed you or enabled you to socialize more? No, I think it's, I, I realized pretty quick that anything fun in life required money. Mm-hmm. They're fun coupons. Yeah. They're quality of life coupons. Everybody says, oh, money doesn't matter to me. I'm not driven by money. Money doesn't matter to you in, until it comes time to buy something or do yeah. something or you need something. Everything from the bed you sleep on to the house or, you rent or to the food you eat. Or to eliminate not not everything in life, but a lot of the the bad things that weigh on your mind. I call it alleviate financial anxiety. Massive. Yeah, hundred percent. So but it at, was but about in twenty one. It, it very much is fun coupons for sure. It was it was about the money for me. I was like, what can I do that can generate the amount of money I need to survive and live? And thrive? remind me to ask you the question later in this interview about what does it mean to you today as a businessman, as a father, as a husband, all that. I'll, I'll come back to that. But so you have this business. It's in multiple states. What was the motivation or what was going through your head as to why you would sell it? Well, I mean, first we were just. We were. I look back at the risks we took and what we were doing, and it was just a massive amount of uncomfort. We were leasing warehouses three weeks before the season would be out, where we already had 3,000 customers signed up in Boston, and then renting 25 box trucks and paying 18-year-olds to drive them around cities. Yeah. We had warehouses flood. We had accidents. Did we you had have insurance? No, of course. We couldn't afford insurance yeah. on everything, right? Yeah, we had the insurance we needed to like maybe save the company but an an insurance claim would have crushed the company so we just took a massive amount of risk we were very uncomfortable we were solving nightmare problems that were emergencies all the time 2015 rolls around and we got a half million bucks in the bank none of our friends that went and got new york city jobs had that you know their lifestyle had creeped they were you know making maybe 150 200 grand a year by then but they're, they're spending they're spending it and they're not entrepreneurs they, they don't have that chunk where holy cow a three-week busy season goes by and we got a half million bucks in the bank so um 
I was like, well, let's, this business is too hard. We got to figure out something else that's going to be scalable and it's going to make us money. Where are there a bunch of dumb people that we can run circles around operationally making really good money? Commercial real estate, baby. <laughs> it didn't take long to realize <laughs> that dumb people can thrive in commercial real estate. Hell yeah. We looked at, no, I'm, I'm serious. We looked at these, these self-storage owners, the people who own self-storage. They didn't answer their phones. They did not have websites. They showed up and made people sign paper leases. They had full-time managers that didn't want to be there sitting in their storage facilities, you know, 75 hours a week, whatever mm -hmm. retail hours were. And we're like, damn, this is a good business where our operational chops that we had eaten dirt for s six years to develop, managing, hiring, marketing, selling, delegating, managing businesses remotely. We had experience in everything that we needed to build a self-storage portfolio. I didn't have any money. Neither did my parents, really. My dad put a little bit of money into the first deal, 120 grand. I didn't know it, but he actually mortgaged our childhood home to mm. do that into a development. But he was excitable, and we were looking at real estate. And I was like, Dad, I think about buying a piece of property for a self-storage facility. And he's like, that's a great idea. We can do it. We can build it. I'll build it. I'll help you. You're like, hold on. I <laughs> haven't told you anything else about it. Exactly. That's a father's love right there. Yeah. He stroked the money in. I went from kitchen table to kitchen table talking to people who didn't actually have any money trying to get money for the next year. No, hold on. Let me let me call time out. Did you have any exposure to self-storage from your uh, pro appropriately named storage <laughs> squad? But uh, what, by, by way of running this storage squad business where you're kind of moving around college kids' possessions, did, did you actually have any exposure? No. no. So we had one thing that was super critical, though. Mm -hmm. We had just enough experience and ammunition to go get a loan from a bank. Got it. We had, we had this. The bankers all thought it was the same. The bankers thought storage squads, self-storage, they're in this business already. They know what mm -hmm. they're doing. And we didn't necessarily no, correct yeah, them. They, <laughs> if they don't ask the question, it's, you know, I'm telling a lie. Yeah, so, no, we were able to get a loan. And in 2000... Was it, was it like, was it like a... a traditional commercial real estate loan or was it like SBA? I didn't I didn't get any advice from any big time real estate people. I went out and I raised money for that first deal on a super unique structure where the debt was my equity. So I sold 20% of the building for 20% of the money, put 10% of the money in or you know 33% of the mm -hmm. cash we needed. The bank put in 70% mm. and that bank equity called it I called it my equity. So I really ended up owning 38 and a half percent of the deal. Got it. Putting in 33% of the cash needed to do the deal. What was the deal? It was a development in upstate New York. A a storage from the ground up, we built a 48,000 square foot self storage facility. We closed on a piece of property for 250 grand. I went and argued with the town for nine months myself to get that building approved. Um, I was the GC of the project. And we came in with a $1.9 million budget, raised the money on a $1.9 million budget, and we spent $2.4 million. And to finish the funding of the deal, I talked to the real estate agent who sold the property to us uh -huh. to stroke a 125 grand check into the deal. Uh. <laughs> did it work out for him? Yeah, it did. Good. No, I, my dad mortgaged, mortgaged the house to make $125,000 investment, and we bought him out in late 21 at $610,000. So, so it was, uh, it worked out. And that's over half of his net worth today, yeah. Oh, that's great. It's amazing. That's That's, that's got a... Well, I don't want to assume. How did that make you feel? I mean, it was it was incredible. Yeah, he, when when we sent the money back to him in in his bank account, I was with him, and uh, he hugged me and cried and said he was proud of me, which is uh, why why I do it. Yeah, which is which was a, it's probably the best day ever. Yeah, for it, a man. I mean, I was gonna say that that had to have been a big moment. <laughs> exactly. And then did your mom pull you aside and give you a talk about not spending it? And <laughs> My mom's always wondered what the hell I do. Nick, how do you make money? I just don't get it. I'm worried about you. Is there something you're not telling us? Where did all the money come you can't from? can't explain to me in less than 30 seconds. What do you do? Yeah, she didn't understand anything about what we had done, how we had you know, carved out our own Being equity. an entrepreneur is not a real job. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is, Mom. It is. It's just it's not a traditional. She thought, she, she's like, are you doing criminal activity, Nick? <laughs> like, I've never seen anybody make this much money this fast for doing not that much work. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. No, commercial real estate's great. As I tell people, you know, you get A's, you become a doctor, you get B's, you become an attorney, you get C's, you go into real estate. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a good... Yeah, and we, a, and, and we held our own, right? Like Us knowing how to run a business, us really caring, and us having that experience of grinding 
you know, grinding in that hard business for six years, we were running circles pretty quickly around other operators and we leased that building up, bought another one across the street. That's what I was going to ask. To walk me through how you go from your first building to 62, 63 locations. Yeah, so I didn't know anybody with any cash. Mm -hmm. So the second building I bought with my own money, it was a three property portfolio in Erie, Pennsylvania, $24 a foot. It was listed on LoopNet and it was going to go to public auction through Kiko's auction in Erie, Pennsylvania. It was going to go to auction on Shout September. Shout out to Kiko, whoever you are. <laughs> September 23rd, 2018 or 19 was when it was going to go to auction. We called and convinced them to let us buy the deal all cash earlier. What, like, what let's was not it about go to the, auction. What was it about the deal that you liked? It was 24,000 square feet. We liked the Erie market. I had been looking around it for some development sites and I, uh, I just said, hey, we can buy this deal for six hundred grand in a bank over here in, in and it was, it was, it was, Farmers it, National Bank was in it, it was already existing storage or was dirt? It was already existing built storage. It. it was an 85-year-old owner, but he had had bad dementia, so 80% of the units were rented but abandoned, and the people weren't paying. It was a total disaster. It was doing four grand a month of revenue. Jeez. We bought it for $625,000, put hundred grand of our own money in the rest was bank debt, um, and when you, just for the audience, let's let them assume they know what that means. When you say you put a hundred and one hundred twenty-five into the, yeah. what what is that? Is that a is that paint? Is that a new roof? Is a new parking? Security? Where, where does it no? Go? That's that makes up the purchase price. So I, that's how I capitalize. Oh, I see the what deal. you say. You're saying your your deposit was one twenty-five. Yeah, I had to wire okay. that money to get the guy comfortable with us as buyers. <laughs> Three days after I talked to the auctioneer on the phone, he's like, "Some kid called me, twenty-six years old. No way he can pull this off." He said, if you can wire me $100,000 and it's hard money by Friday, I'll call off the auction and you guys can buy it at this price. The owner likes it. So we wired the money. Three days after we found this deal, we, I wired 100 grand, which is a shitload of money to me. Mm -hmm. Wired him the money and they called so off the auction. We basically bought that deal. a hard money deposit pass through escrow, though. It don't, sounds like it didn't even go through escrow. No escrow allowed. He said, you saw the properties. Do you want them? <laughs> no paperwork? Uh, yeah, we had, we had a contract, but it was the auction no, contract. No, I'm sorry. It's as, um, it's as did if you have we any, won. Did you have any historical financials? Uh, none. He handed me a box of old leases from the 90s, oh, and geez. we had to tr track down all those customers. But we we had a massive auction. We turned the property around, and uh, by 2020, two years after, or a year and a half after we bought it, it was doing twenty thousand dollars a month of revenue, up from four. And we went to the bank and got it appraised for two million bucks. Refied. Borrowed one point two and uh, put more cash in our coffers to buy another sure. deal in Pittsburgh. And then we bought another deal on our own in Gloversville, New York. Uh, we just got really scrappy to buy as many deals as we could all while I was talking to investors. But they weren't country club investors. They were, they were people from Perry County, Indiana, who that had might, a couple that, hundred grand. Look, that might be the segue I used to get into the social media, but hold on a second. There's a lot of risk in, in a lot of these decisions. Um, Thus far, you you know, you talked about the risk associated with the storage squad business and the potential liability and how to, you know, not that not being scalable, but, um, you know, buying a deal on a product type that you're going to develop with no development experience as a first foray into a product type at 25 years old, then wiring money, 125,000, which was probably a significant chunk of your net worth at the time, hard within days of seeing it again for, for, Anybody listening who's in the real estate profession, they're going to be able to say, okay, that that that's not normal. Like deals typically don't get done. Mm -hmm. Like Nick is shooting from the hip. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're listening and you don't have commercial real, real estate experience, trust me when I say like that is a, those are risky decisions that paid off big. So my question is, do you just from early on just have had a big appetite for risk where it doesn't affect you? Or do you think it's it was some naivety um, around how much risk it was? It was almost like you didn't really know how big of a risk you were taking. That's why you did it. If you had actually known at the time how um, uncommon those decisions you were making were, you might have hesitated. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have, I wasn't armed with too much information, period. Like I thought, hey, Dan, like if we turn this around, it can do 15 grand a month of revenue. He's and we're like, this is this is something that we don't need to stress about. Let's just do this. Let's go. And we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't overanalyze it. And yeah, just extreme confidence and arrogance. And I've always been a confident, you know, cocky person. I try to 
I've, as I've gotten older, I've had, <laughs> it doesn't seem like it when you follow me on social media, but I've gotten even, I've gotten more humble and, and understanding of other people. But I was just, I thought that I was the best and I just thought that I could you make these decisions. And I thought, yeah, we can figure this out. Let's go. Let's do it. And the downside was not that bad. Like I've, my wife had a job. I had a family with an extra bedroom. I had safety nets. So I was like, what's the absolute worst thing that could happen here? What do you think? allowed you to develop that uh, confident, cocky mindset that led you to take these mm-hmm. risks. Let me make... to tell you something that's pretty yeah. contrarian. Sure. I was, a, I was a big fish in a small pond. I was the most athletic kid in my little bitty high school. I ran Ivy League track instead of SEC track. I took the easy classes. I started a business, the first business where not very many people started it. The competition was pretty weak. And I just, I got addicted to winning and I didn't keep leveling up trying to do harder and harder and harder things. I didn't go to New York City and try to make it. I didn't go to San Francisco and try to start a tech company against all the Stanford graduates. I, I just won. I was a winner, even though relatively I wasn't anything special. I was a white kid from Southern Indiana running track. I just didn't race against the kids that were world class. And so was that, were you conscious of this like, hey, I love winning, I'm addicted to it, so let me put myself in a position where the probabilities of winning are much higher because the competition's much lower? Yes. yes. Got it, I, okay. I was like, hey, I can, go, I can go to New York City and I can play basketball against LeBron James. And yes, the ego and everybody's advice is like, you know, find a room where you're the dumbest person in the room. Well, what about this small town entrepreneurship opportunity where I'm playing basketball against a, a fourth grade girl and I'm, I'm 6'2". Let's go compete where I can win. That was my mindset. I'm looking it up. Is, was, it, was it Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett? I think it was Charlie Munger who said competition is for suckers. Was that, was that who said that? I realized that business is, a, business is a beautiful thing because A, many, many people can win. Tons of people can win. You don't have to be the smartest person to win. Peter Thiel said that, sorry. Yeah, but there's this, there's this narrative that goes around social media, like find the gym where you're the fattest, fit, you know, out of shape person there. Yeah. Be, if, you're in the, if you're the best person in the gym, you're in the wrong gym. You hear these things all the time where, well, Malcolm Gladwell studied it, and he studied it in outliner, Outliers, and he figured out that the kids who were born at the right time and started dominating their peers at the right time and started getting the confidence. They had more fun. They started winning. They had more fun. They started winning. They, they had the best more coaching. Fun. Then they start getting better coaching. Then they yeah. keep leveling up and moving up. I'm not saying to never level up. You got to get out of those ponds eventually and go into the, you know, you know go bigger. But I just was lucky enough to never really set myself up to, to lose and, and, and shatter my confidence. Well, it, it definitely goes against the mainstream narrative. Um, as you said, you know, be the dumbest guy in the room, whatever you want to talk about, is uh, when Peter Hill says competition is for losers or for suckers, he's basically saying like, a lot of people go out there and it's like, oh, I love competition. Like, I, I want the best competition. And, his, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing. He basically like, why would you want? why would you want that? Why wouldn't you rather for your business have an industry or a field where, well, for some reason, there is no competition or tertiary self-storage? And, you know, 2018-19, there wasn't the competition there was in a lot of other asset classes. If you want your kid to, be, to get into golf, would you take him and have him play the tips at a professional golf course with hazards all around and on the fastest greens? Probably not. He's going to hate it. Losing sucks. You play five rounds and you can't have any fun, you're going to quit. I started a little moving company, made a little money, went a little bigger the next year, went a little bigger the next year, built a self-storage facility. And then amazing things happened that 10 years later, when you got money, you got operational chops, you're used to winning, you got more confidence, you can do bigger things and you can you know, le- keep leveling up. And it, it increases the probability of being successful quicker, faster, bigger when you do step up. Yeah. Because you have that that experience um so you went from one to two to four to 60 some storage sites well we went to four and then we couldn't buy anymore because we were out of money and we had no investors there you go but that's when i got on twitter that's there you go because you were saying (laughs) like you 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 said something earlier about kind of raising money going table to table and and i was like if i had to guess that's probably why uh even maybe unbeknownst to you but i'll I'll, I'll let you answer the question why you would get on a, a platform and and leverage it to ultimately, you know, now I'm in, on so many different levels, but maybe raise capital. What was the original idea behind getting on Twitter? I had a 
podcast episode in 2018 on the Sweaty Startup that said, social media is for losers. That said, if you don't want to argue about sports... As you were making a podcast. If you don't want to, if you want to argue about sports and get mad at Donald Trump, get on Twitter. And other than that, it's a waste of freaking time. It's like the news. But my friend Moses Kagan had seen me writing on Reddit trying to promote my podcast said, Nick, you got to get on Twitter. There's real well, deal Hold on. Why, why did you make it? So why did you start a podcast then? You know, that's a really good question. I don't know. I was mentoring my brother who started a lawn care company, kept that lawn care company going, moved it to Bloomington. He runs it full time today with about three employees. Um, and I was just like, damn, I'm going to make a podcast. And I got excited about and it. I got and energized and so by it. So the podcast was about just startup companies? Yeah, small businesses. It's like small Silicon businesses. Valley's bullshit, basically. Yeah. All the rich people I know started normal, boring businesses that have been done before. They did common things uncommonly well. They didn't go try and reinvent the wheel. They didn't try to make a new invention. They didn't try to educate a market. They didn't care what their moat was. I call them tinkers, like inventors. Everyone's trying to invent something. It's like, no, nah, I just find something that somebody already invented and I just tinker with and make it a little better. Yeah. Your business, my business. I've done nothing. I've done nothing yeah. new. Okay, yeah, we innovate inside of our companies. Like, yeah, we do things better, but we're not in, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good businesses out there that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I agree. Oh, Amen. Uh, we're a brokerage company, man. It's not that complicated. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so you're you're running this podcast now. Are you having people on who are in different businesses, or are you just kind of open? No, just me. It, it it was ten minute episodes. Me talking about what I'm learning while I'm building companies. And how many? listeners were you getting before you met Moses? Like? So three or four per episode. <laughs> Growing a podcast is extremely hard. It's one of the hardest things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it again with my reach that I have today because growing a podcast is so hard. Zach, you told me that it was going to be easy. <laughs> I mean, we're doing pretty well. I, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I think today the Sweaty Startup podcast gets about 3,000 listeners a week, and the Nick Huber show, the real estate one, gets about 1,500. So I'm happy with that. It's a great asset for me, but... Um, I got on, got on Twitter, and I just basically my first— Wait, no, hold on. You, you were on Reddit. Yeah, and Reddit is a cesspool of anti-capitalist— uh, I was going to say Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to talk about Reddit because they'll post it on Reddit, and they'll, they'll, the, the woke mob will come after me. Yeah, but yeah there's I a, like the woke mob. Uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some um, unhinged humans on Reddit. Yeah, there really is. Yeah, so I got really good at writing copy by practicing and trying to promote my podcast on Reddit. Um, it worked a little bit. Got a couple followers. Moses found me and said, "Nick, you got to go to Twitter. Like people aren't like that over there." But so on a on a different note, Moses is on Reddit. He he. <laughs> some for some reason, so Moses saying, hangs out on Reddit. I didn't even find you on there. He's he's probably got some in a non account just posting, <laughs> just posting <laughs> hate hate speech. I know it's a bunch of. I know it's a bunch of. Reddit's brutal. Yeah. All right, so you post like, hey, guys, I'm, I have started this podcast. I'm just mm -hmm. learning about you know, startup businesses. And I could only imagine just the hatred coming your way. Yep, yep. I started talking about hiring, firing, delegating, and I was actually growing a company. Oh, my gosh. And, and these people hated that. Yeah. But anyway, he found me. I got on Twitter, and I the first tweet was about that, that deal in Erie, Pennsylvania, where we bought that deal, how we bought it, how we found it, pictures of us sawing off the locks in the snow, opening the units and finding like old stuff that hadn't been touched in 10 years. And uh, it took off pretty quick on Twitter. So, so the thing about Twitter, everybody wants to grow on Twitter, but nobody's willing to do anything interesting. They just want to post what they have for breakfast in the morning. Yeah. If, or they want to share other stories of big entrepreneurs, but they're not actually building companies themselves. Everybody on social media is very selfish. They're scrolling social media. What can I learn from this person? What can I extract from this person? Is this going to give me any yeah, what value can, at all? What can I take? Yeah, what can I take? What can I learn? And when I start saying, hey, this is how we bought a self-storage property for 625 grand, and now it's worth $2 bucks," they're like, damn, I can learn something from this guy. Hmm. And that's how I grew on there. And so when did you start? What, what year were you? 2020, February of 2020 was my first tweet. No. Yep. That's not that long ago. Nope. And fast forward today, how many times have you tweeted? Oh, uh Probably 50,000 tweets. 50,000. How many followers do you have? 340,000, 335. 340,000. Yeah. So it grew fast. Yeah, I can make one tweet and it can send. I have a property and casualty insurance business, insurance for real estate. I made one tweet about that last week and we got 70 leads of about $500 million worth of real estate that we're going to bid on and grow that company. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm growing companies on the back Got of this it. So, so it's, it's kind of what you said earlier, you're going to bring in the customers. You're, you're basically widening the funnel. Exactly. So let me take a step back. So Moses reaches out 
and he says, you got to get on Twitter and why this is because this is a great way to raise money. What was he just said? There's there's people there that will accept your message. Like I'm seeing you getting brutalized on Reddit. He, he didn't say come raise money here. He just mm -hmm. said your message would be welcome in the in the Twitter community. There's actual deal makers on Twitter. And yeah, before I knew it, I had DMs with investors that today have put over a million bucks with me. We got on Zoom. We got to know each other. And then I was able to finally buy some storage. I was going <laughs> to say, did, did that solve your capital it did. need? Yep. And it's not like I was advertising for capital. They would DM me. We'd get to know each other. And then I would raise money from them to go buy deals. But 2020, 2020 we bought, right at the end of the year, we bought maybe 15 or $20 million worth of storage from mm -hmm. with, with investors we met on Twitter. 2021, we bought $50 million worth of storage. Our team grew to 45 people. We built out acquisitions. We, we streamlined a lot of things. And then 2022, we bought 38. And in 2023, we'll close the year with $1.2 million of transactions. Great trajectory. Yeah, walk me through that. Uh, I mean, the opportunity was there to buy deals. That was cheap. We could, we could put in remote management. We could raise rents to market. We could cut costs and turn them into nine cap deals. It got more, everybody was onto it. it. Got more, harder to buy. Mm -hmm. Transaction volume, deals were not as good. Those Matthews got, guys cold calling all those owners, telling them that they could get them more money. Yep, data data spread really quickly about how much storage was worth. These owners all got called by brokers and, and told their properties were worth $100 a foot in 2021. And uh, they haven't reset their, price, their pricing expectations, even though rent's down move-in velocity is way down, and debt costs are double. That's why transaction velocity is down 70 80% storage, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you starting to see pricing move? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're starting to see some distress in the storage market. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. I think my, my company is a sleeping giant. We have put some amazing acquisitions people in place. We are staying disciplined. We're keeping them motivated. I have a great CFO. I have a great head of ops. Um, and when the market opens back up, it's going to be amazing. So what do you? what is your day-to-day -day involvement in Bolt Storage? Is it just, like, are you, you're not... I'm you're, on the investor call. Or okay. I, I'm on, I write an investor letter every quarter. I think a lot about strategy. I'm managing our risk. I look at every deal before we put an offer on, even briefly, 30 seconds to verify that my team underwrote it correctly. Mm -hmm. The assumptions we're making are realistic and how much money we're going to raise. And then I say yes or no on the offer amount that we're going to give. And then... I get on the acquisitions call every Tuesday morning where we talk to our three cold callers that call full time and, and, so and talk about the pipeline. Five, 10 hours a week? Yeah, five hours. Yeah, 10. It's, the, it's my most active business, absolutely. I'm most active in bolt storage. I talk about all my other companies. 80% um, of my net worth and 80% of my mental energy goes to my real estate portfolio. So I'm going to dumb it down. You got, let's call it 10 different companies yep. and Bolt is your most involved for you, which is five to 10 hours? Yeah, 10 hours a week, I would say. So you're basically a professional decathlete, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Damn. I, nobody's put that together, but yes. I mean, I, it's pretty easy to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very good at switching disciplines. With I just family. thought of a tweet for you. You change your Twitter bio, like, you know, college decathlete. Now I'm a professional decathlete. Because de, de, decathlete... Decathlon is is ten events, and ideally you're great at all of them. But you just need to be really good enough to where across the spectrum of ten events you're better than everyone else. Yep, and you're not going to let your mind lose control when you have a bad event. That yeah. was what I was really good at. Um, I didn't care enough. I had other things I was excited about. I love the fact that I don't have to put a square peg in a round hole in real estate. Yeah, I don't have to make a deal work because I'm bored. I don't have to go chase another deal even if the opportunity is not there to, to close that deal. I have other things that are exciting, whether it's adventure with my kids, meeting people like you, all the things about life that I'm excited about so that I don't have to, I don't have to force it. And, and real estate is a game of patience, man. I want to buy point, these yeah. properties. I want to own them for a really long time. The rest will take care of itself. Buy them, manage them well, don't die. That's my real estate plan. And if I do that and I buy enough and I hold them long enough, I'm going to get really freaking rich. It happens. Families prove it all the time. I don't understand the guys who are always buying, selling, buying, selling, buying, yeah. selling, because then you're just you're a service business. You're paying a ton of taxes, and like real estate's the most tax efficient business in the world, and most people don't take advantage of that. That it is one of the many reasons I love it. Um, one of the 
biggest mistakes, and it, it, it's interesting because I never would have thought this, but I see in the literally at this point thousands of people I've had the privilege to manage over the years is so many people allow perfect to be the enemy of good. You've heard that saying. Yep, yep. And as a decathlete, in a literal sense, as a decathlete, as an entrepreneur, one of the things, if I had to guess for you, I could speak for myself, is I just don't let perfect be the enemy of good for me. I'm like, hey, I, you should. I'd love to be perfect, but as long as I'm good and I just keep moving forward, if I make a mistake, like, eh, I just keep moving. And I think it, also the further you get in the weeds on something, the more likely you're to mess up the key yeah, decisions. Yeah. Like the, in, in business, there's three or four key decisions that if you get right, if you get these things right, good things will really happen. You put good people in these seats, you make a couple strategic decisions right, great things will happen. Whereas if I'm in my computer playing around with a spreadsheet for 10 hours straight, I'm way more likely to talk myself into I, a bad deal. You, you mentioned Malcolm Gladwell earlier, the author. I think he wrote a book called Blink. I did read it. I just, you know, 10 years ago, how much do I retain? But I think it was about that, was the longer you spend um, on a decision, many times it's almost like you come to a worse outcome. And investing, it happens all the time. The best companies in the history of the world, nine months ago or a year ago, have it in value. Google, Microsoft, Meta, Apple. They're the best companies to ever exist. They've outperformed everything over the last 15 years, and they probably will the next 15 years. And yet, when Facebook was $88, and Mark Zuckerberg's at the helm, <laughs> all the really smart investors said, this is the next Yahoo. It's dead. It's going to die. And everybody said, Google, you know, man, it's getting hammered. But you know what? It, it got down to a 15 price earnings ratio. All the, ma all the amazing investors were like, really risky buy right now. Really risky buy. I was like, really? Google just went 50% off. It halved. Of course, it's back to all-time highs now. Say, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, 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 the magnificent seven stocks have done quite well this year. Um, all right. So you said Bolt's the storage business. Um, that's the biggest chunk of your net worth. But talk to us about some of the other companies. What are they and how did they spring up? So I realized that as I was tweeting, as I was writing my newsletter on hiring and firing and managing and growing businesses and real estate and everything that you know I was learning along the way, I realized that, hey, I all of a sudden have this audience of people who are running companies. People who are running businesses. And as a business owner, I looked at my line items of what I was spending money on. And it was web development. It was pay-per-click marketing. It was SEO services. It was insurance. It was cost segregation. It was recruiting. It was U.S.-based recruiting and overseas recruiting. It was all these different services that I was needing and paying for as a business owner. And I realized that, hey, I can, I can find somebody who does this stuff really, really well, find a world-class operator who has grown teams and is really good at performance marketing, whatever it is that I'm going to do. I can partner with them and I can fill the funnel with customers they can build teams and do what they do best, and we can build a really big business very quickly. And we've done it a couple times already, and it's awesome. What, what, is it, what is your most exciting business that's not storage? The cost segregation firm is the one that I'm most excited about. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, when, yeah, you, explain to the audience. when you buy a piece of real estate, it, like if you buy this microphone for a business, you deduct it all year one. It's a $250 mic or $400 mic, and it, you just write it off against your taxes. But a piece of real estate, you depreciate it. You, you write it off against your taxes over 39 years for commercial real estate and 27 years for residential. But there's different parts of the real estate, the walls, the HVAC, the sidewalks, the garage doors, all these things that have shorter lifespans. So what you can do is you can pay a firm to go in there and get these costs all different and write it off a lot quicker. They break it down. Yeah, yeah they, they, they break, break the it down, down into the parts. And it turns out that the IRS says, okay, you, you can... You can destroy straight line depreciate this commercial building over 39 years, but a roof you can depreciate over 20 and the carpet you could depreciate over five. And, mm -hmm. you know, in a gas station, the canopy, I think it's five. Like, and there's some loopholes in the tax code called bonus depreciation that allows yeah, was, investors to, I was to gonna say, you yeah. know, you buy $100 million worth of storage, you can get 10 or $20 million deduction yeah. the year that you buy it. So, and so I was it, doing a ton of these cost segs. My CPA, Mitchell Baldridge, had done a ton of them in his firm, but never really offered it as a service. We found an amazing engineer who had done a shitload of cost segs. We hired him, me and Mitchell, and Mitchell's wife became CEO. She was a big four consultant badass. She came in to run the company. We started it and we got our first customer in July of 2022. Um, we've had three straight months over $300,000 of revenue. We have 30 engineers now, and we're doing a ton of cost segs, over a mm. thousand so far this year. But that's going to be a, it's going to be a, 
twenty million dollar company do in a you, year. Do you have any concern that will slow down as the bonus depreciation component kind of winds down? Absolutely. But when you're transacting larger chunks of real yeah. estate, you always need to, to cost seg anyway, and the transaction volume will come back. Look, I think you, it's a great time to build a firm. I agree. Even with the bonus depreciation winding down, every owner of commercial real estate should be cost saving. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking how many, especially on the private capital side, don't. I, I didn't realize that like, we take meetings all the time at RE Cost Seg with people who don't even know it exists and they own no, $20 million plus of real it's, estate. It's one of the the talking points. And, and you know, as, as a real estate brokerage company, we have to be careful not giving tax advice, mm -hmm. you know, so we have to provide the, the, the CYAs and the disclaimers. But strong, strong recommendations and advice to consult a, a, mm -hmm. a, a CPA or tax firm of which we could provide recommendations about cost segregation because there's almost no reason why you wouldn't. Yeah, and in 2017, before 2017, it was only if you developed a building from the ground up, not if you bought one. You couldn't bonus depreciate those. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great business. Um, that's going to be a really big one. I have a recruiting company that recruits Filipino and Latin American talent that's a million-dollar-plus a month of revenue now and worth $25, $30 million already three, months after, three years after it was founded. So we're growing some really big businesses, um, by promoting them and marketing the right way. How many, like, it's, it's hard to, because most people I talk to, they, they do one thing, and we've, we've, <laughs> we've covered why you don't. I do um, one thing as well. I, I wrangle and track talent. I'm, I'm That's saying, all I do. I track talent. Yeah, how would I say it? In a more traditional sense, they have one business card. Right? <laughs> they, have, they, have one, um, they have one title. Uh, so it's hard to... <laughs> I mean, what I get, my question is this, how many hours a week do you find yourself working on average right now? 30. 30. I don't think I've ever, and this kind of goes against the Matthews Mentality podcast mantra, but I don't think I've ever averaged over 40-hour work week for a full year in my life. So the Matthews Mentality would suggest, wow, Nick, you're doing great, 30 hours a week. Imagine what you could do if you did 60 hours a week. I think I would be in the weeds working on the wrong things. I think I have a few, and, and look, it's an evolution. I'm not talking to somebody who's just starting out. Freaking grind, work. I was, I was in a seasonal business. Those three months of busy season, I fucking worked. I slept mm -hmm. in warehouses. I crushed myself. I would lose 20 pounds. But then I'd go hang out in Florida and work 20 hours a week on important shit the rest of the time. It allowed me to step back and make, like, okay, where's the highest leverage activity that I can work on? And it sounds like a lot of the opportunity to uh, grow your wealth and not, have to work crazy hours is from your social media. I'm, op I'm operating all of a sudden from a massive point of leverage. Okay, but a question for you as it relates to social media, and, and I think I've asked this a couple of times in the past on this podcast, Zach, is um, do you think your message would have been uh, as well received if you didn't have the credibility of actually having done what you had done in terms of uh, the storage flips and all that? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and that's an unfortunate part and uncomfortable part of social media is that you have to brag on yourself. Because every piece of advice that I get on the internet, I filter through the quality of the person who gave me the advice. So, so that, I was if someone say, non yeah. in there, if, if, you know, Mom's Basement 42069 makes a comment on my tweet and says, Nick, you're a dumbass. You're thinking about all these things the wrong way. This is exactly how you're going to go broke. Probably going to ignore it. But if Warren Buffett or Elon Musk responds to my tweet and says, Nick, you're a dumbass. These are all the ways yeah, that you can right, go broke. Let me, let, me, let me evaluate what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's what I was getting is, and it gets back to working, is you had to uh, clearly at some point work very hard from a traditional just time and energy poured into, you know, meeting with the city for nine months, developing a project from the ground up as the GC, driving which trucks and warehouses, driving yeah. trucks, warehouses, all that. Um I've had this conversation with some of the younger professionals, not just at, at this company, but just in general who ask for advice because like, oh, I see you're on social media. And I was like, this is my opinion. I, I, it's a strong opinion, but it's like you got to give the world a reason to value your opinion before you give the world your opinion. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And so you had... That's what everybody's afraid to do. So you had given the world a reason to value your advice on how to build a startup business because you had effectively done it multiple times, created a successful startup. Yeah. I mean, why? You look at the top 10,000 accounts on Twitter and the ones with the most followers. 10% of them are politicians who rose up through the swamp to get to the top. 10% of them are professional athletes that are the best in the world at what they do. Mm -hmm. Then you got musicians that are the best in the world. Then you, it's, it's no different in business. 
People want to follow people who have done notable things, period. That's it. Yeah, and, and you know. So I, unfortunately, if you want to build a big audience and you want to have all this leverage and you want to have all this fun, you want to meet people, unfortunately, you got to go do the damn work first. <laughs> you have to have the credibility. Yeah. And I think that's where so many young professionals are looking to skip the line where it's like, hey, you got to go actually put in the work and build a career that you can then use as your credibility piece when you go out and give a bunch of advice and look to leverage social media in other ways. I, at I least that's how I and, see it. I was listening yeah. to you and Trent talk, and, and you made a very good point, but I kind of disagree with part of it. You said a year's experience is a year's experience. So many kids nowadays just want to skip it. They want to get a year's experience in three months. Well, I actually kind of have some advice on how to get a different type of experience. So, yes, you're absolutely right that a year's experience is a year's experience, but not all experience is created equal. I found an environment of chaos. I found a chaotic environment where tons of problems, tons of dynamic situations. I had to learn a lot really fast, and I got 20 years of normal experience in five years because I was going out doing crazy things. I was mm -hmm. uncomfortable every day. I was having to fire people that stood up in my wedding a couple of weeks before, and they're crying in my arms because that's what happens when you hire friends and family. I had to watch one of my drivers put diesel fuel in my gasoline truck on the busiest day of the year when we could not afford that to happen. I had to go into a warehouse that had flooded and I had to call 20 parents and say, hey, look, your stuff got ruined. I just uncomfortable, difficult situations day after day after day after day after day. And when you're in that environment of chaos, amazing things happen and you can really grow. So my advice to a uh, somebody who just wants to do well in life, whether you're working for a company or being an entrepreneur, I, I pretty firmly believe that something I've changed my mind on is that not everybody's built to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody should try. Would you say not everybody or most people? Not at, mo I think 95% of people are not cut out for what it takes to be an entrepreneur. I agree. They pay us the big bucks because we do really hard shit. We have uncomfortable conversations. We take a lot of risk. That's not for everybody. Most people want to go home at five o'clock and turn their phone off. That can't exist when you're an entrepreneur. But my advice for a 21 year old or a 35 year old who wants to kick ass and make a lot of money, whether it be for somebody else or not, find an environment of chaos with an aggressive owner, a business where the owner is aggressive and wants to grow and they are growing fast and it's chaos because then the people who are good, they get, they rise to the top. It's not like you go work for JP Morgan in New York city. And if you have an idea, they say, huh, go back to your desk. <laughs> mm -hmm. What, um, You've spoken a lot about the benefits of being an entrepreneur. You know, obviously, ideally, wealth follows that. But maybe it's getting to a point where you don't have to work, as, spend as much time in the grind, but you could still participate in wealth creation. What have been the biggest drawbacks or what have been the biggest challenges associated with your career, your career pursuits? Just the, the sheer number of uncomfortable things you have to deal with when you're the owner of a business. You know it. When our phone rings... If our phone rang right now, yeah. it's a problem. Other people that are inside of a company, they just get to pass that problem on to somebody above them. Hey, that's not my pay grade. I'm going to pass it on. So yeah, it's uncomfortable situation after uncomfortable situation. The phone rings and damn, I got to fire somebody. What, what was the closest you ever got probably associated with the most uncomfortable moment where you might have even entertained the idea of like, maybe I don't want to do oh, this? Um, I, I know the answer to that vividly. I was in Boston. It was 2014. We had just gotten 10 times as many customers as we thought we were going to get. And the pickup season was not organized. Meaning if we have a bad pickup season, we pick up all these boxes and they're not labeled, they're not put in the right spot. Delivery is going to be a nightmare. And we didn't even know what we didn't know. We show up to deliver this stuff. And delivery season also spans out in Boston from August 15th to September 15th. It's a long season. And in that month period, I worked all but three hours a day. I would drive trucks all day, get home, make the schedules, answer customer service emails until 2 a.m., then load the, tr uh, load the trucks up from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. and send them back out. And I go run a truck by myself. And somebody would bring me another full truck after lunch. I I'd unload that truck myself too. I did that for seven days straight. I was underweight. I hadn't eaten enough. I, was, I, say, I lost uh, 20, I weight, 20 pounds. My pants were falling off. I was chafing so bad between my legs that I was, it was bloody. Um, I was taking showers with baby wipes in the back of my truck and putting on new shirts and throwing away the old ones. I'm sleeping in the warehouse. And seven days in, 
my employees were f- failing. They were f- quitting. They were, they were leaving. It was getting worse and worse and worse. And on one day, somebody topped the truck on Sturrow Drive in Boston. So ripped the top off of a truck by going down a road they shouldn't have went down. And another guy abandoned the truck in Brighton, just left it, left the keys. I pulled over on the side of the road and had a mental breakdown. Called my mom, crying, saying, what the fuck am I doing with my life? That was a horrible idea to call her because that just stressed her out yeah. really bad. Um, yeah, curled up in a little ball in a bush. I know exactly where I was in Boston. Like, and then called my business partner, and he's like, Nick, get your shit together. He's like, what are you going to do? Like, get up, get in the truck, and drive. Yeah, this isn't helping. Yeah, get up, get in the truck, and drive. He said it four times. I hung up the phone, got up, got in the truck, and drove. <laughs> and you just worked through it? Just worked, yeah. But it was um, – that's the stuff that – uh, will make you not want to be there. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And that's when you said, we need to sell. <laughs> no, we didn't sell that thing for six more years after that. <laughs> that's when you said, we need to figure out this pickup strategy. <laughs> this pickup yes! strategy. <laughs> that's when we said, we got to get better. Yeah, exactly. But again, right. that actually speaks to your 20 years of experience in five years. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's accelerating the, uncom- the horridly uncomfortable moments that – really are in essence required for for personal growth. Yeah, and I realized that if I can't delegate and hire and manage people, I'm never going to succeed. I'm never going to get and, rich. And, and I'm just I'm just very very high level generalizing. A normal person has, you know, two or three moments a year that are really uncomfortable that force growth or like whether it's a really tough decision or mm-hmm. recognizing a failure or even dealing with success, um you're accelerating it to like 30 to 40 a year. I was 23 years old when that happened. Yeah. Insanity. I, I had no business doing that. Most 23-year-olds are driving a truck, and they pull over to the side, and they say, man, I don't want to do this anymore, and they just leave it there in Brighton, right? Exactly right. He was 18, old Terrence. <laughs> I love Terrence. He probably, he probably follows you on Twitter and, and puts nasty comments on all your posts. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the biggest post you ever had? What's the, dude, what, what was the post that kind of just went crazy? Yeah, and, and on New Year's, January 3rd, a couple days after New Year's in 2021, I had a post that got 40,000 likes um, and a bunch of famous people commented on it. And it was a a post about business advice. And you said, I think Donald Trump is a great president. (laughs) It wasn't even. No, I'm sorry. You said (laughs) likes. I think Donald Trump is a terrible president. (laughs) Exactly. On Twitter, if you should put Trump in anything, it's going to amplify it. It's like the algorithm picks it up. But this post, this this uh, thread changed my life. The, like a couple days later, I got invited to a, te- a group text with Sahil Bloom and uh, Greg Eisenberg and, Sh- and Sean Perry and Austin Reef and those guys. And then we started all collaborating together. I got put in the in crowd after that post. And then I started growing a lot. You're a cool kid. What was the exactly. post? It was about business advice. Like it said, um, time for a stiff drink and all the things, all the, and all the bad advice that you've gotten in your life. And I went on to describe like all the bad advice that I think is around entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. whether it's this, the, what we're talking about being the sm- big fish in a small pond or something, some things like that. And it was 60 posts and um, it, it went off. So you just did a thread. Very cool. What was the, um, as it relates to your social media, what was the worst post? And I don't mean from performance. I mean, where you're like, God, like it could have been a nasty comment or. Yeah, there's. Generally, I've I've gotten very thick skin on Mom's Basement 42069 commenting and saying that I'm an idiot. That guy really bothers you, though. <laughs> he does. He's got a special place in my heart. But it, the stuff that hurts is when a pretty notable person in our community, because re- real estate Twitter has you know two or three hundred active people. They're commenting. They're talking about their deals. And when one of those people says some really mean things about me or other people, that's when it kind of hurts because it comes from a place where there's there's some truth to it and you know and you actually know them and like, you know and everybody else in the community respects their, them and their opinion as well so it sucks but i've lucky i've been lucky enough to uh, look I'm, I'm not i'm not a fraud i'm actually building businesses i'm actually in the trenches doing this stuff so i i've been lucky enough not to like have any big nightmares what is your like liar. is there and if so what is your the end game so to speak for the social media strategy um i want to make them i want to make it's just my entrepreneurial journey. I want to make a thousand millionaires in my companies, but before I die, whether they're employees, whatever, you, you're making a lot of millionaires too. Like you have people in your company who are making a million a year, right? That's as a millionaire, you chalk chalk one of them up. Before I die, I want to make a thousand. Yeah, of those. I never thought about it. If I had to, now I always say, 
I don't make anyone successful. I put them in a position to be successful. They choose success exactly. or they choose failure. But you're um, giving them an opportunity to do that. How many people have I put in a position that actually went on to make a million bucks in the last eight years? Probably well over a hundred. I'd have to think about that. Um, yeah, probably like 120, 130. I'd have to See? think. I've, I've never looked at You're it. You're 10% of the way there. I'm 10% of the way there. And I figure if I can make a billion dollars along the way, that'd be nice. But I, I will <laughs> say, and, and I, 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 you were shaking your head yes. Like, I think so. I think you'd agree with me. I mean it when I say I, don't, I, don't, I won't ever make anyone successful. Um, today, we'll hire two people. They'll be hired in the same office and the same product type and the same geography with the same mentor. Like, and one will make it and one won't. And that actually proves it's up to the individual to choose success or choose failure because it's, it's chosen every day when they wake up. It's chosen every day when they show up and what activities is chosen because everyone's going to struggle. Everyone's going to have failures. Everyone's going to get hung up on. Everyone's going to have a deal fall out. And, and mm -hmm. they, that choice will be made when they choose to be a victim or if they say, you know what, that sucks. I don't like it, but I'm going to keep going. Yep. So I'm uh, trying to attract people just as you are. Yeah. I think our jobs today are very, very similar. We're literally hunting and attracting talent and putting them in positions to succeed. Yeah. That's all we're doing. So I'm trying to attract the right type of people. My messaging, everything I do, I'm trying to attract the what, right what, type what of people. What is that? Could, did, uh, just give us a stereotype on what, who is that? What is that person you're looking I think, to attract? I think if we just look at the United States, I think 70% of people are totally incompetent. They can't manage their own life. They can't manage their finances. They can't manage their health. They can't manage their relationships. They, they're leaving a wake of destruction in their path. And they still vote. <laughs> yes. So I obviously we want to weed those out. I don't want them reaching out to me. But then of the people who actually try, most of them aren't just, they're just not cut out for it. As an entrepreneur, I've been consistently just awakened to the fact that not everybody's cut out for it. Not everybody's good at decision making. Not everybody wants it. People are interested in other things. While you and I are very motivated by our careers and, and money and building businesses and growth, that's, that excites us. Most people could care less about that. So what do I'm, most people care about? Most people care about, I, I guess, if we just look at their lives as a reflection of what they care about, they care about scrolling TikTok, watching Netflix, ordering Uber Eats, watching porn, and uh, sitting on the couch. So just feeling good in an immediate sense. Yeah, they can't delay gratification. Yeah. So I'm looking for people who are willing to delay gratification. They're willing to do the hard stuff now so that they can do the fun stuff five years from now. Um, and that are good decision makers and good leaders and good communicators. I have a theory on gratification and delayed gratification is that gratification, much like money, compounds the longer you allow it to like that you don't touch the gratification. Oh, Amazing. Right. It's, I look at a career as a snowball. And at the top of the hill, you got a pebble. When you're when you get out of college, nobody wants to hire you. You have no actual good skills because college isn't really about that. And it's fine. It's fine. I'm not dissing college in any way. I had an amazing experience. I would go back. My kids are going to go to college. College is because parents want you out of the house by 18, but the world's not ready for you until you're about 22. Yeah, 22. so you come out and you're... And it's you're like a holding tank. You, you come out of college and you're just forced... They, they throw you to the dogs and you're forced to try to make it in a world where nobody wants you and you can't add, add value to any company. <laughs> Kyle wants you. You can come I'm here. about to say, Matthew, dude, we're built, we're, we're built on... Give, what, but you teach, have to what, what I say is I said, listen, I, I can teach you skill sets. I can't teach you mindsets. Yep. You exactly. know, I, I could teach you from a real estate perspective how to underwrite, how to, you know, the sales cadence. Um, I'm thinking about your business. You could teach them in, in essence, you could give them a playbook on how to be an entrepreneur, but you can't have, give them, you can't teach them the mindset on how to be an entrepreneur. I figure I'm going to have to hire 50,000 people over the years to, to get a, to get a, a thousand, 2%. Yeah. I think two, I think 2% really have it really have it and can, yeah. and can just make it happen. So, but yeah, the career is a, a snowball at the top of a hill, and the faster you can get it rolling down and the more snow you're willing to pack on it before you cut a big chunk off. And if every time you switch a job, you're, you're abandoning that snowball and you go to a different industry or you go do something else or you get bored and you go to a, a greener pasture on the other side of the fence. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's delayed gratification and sales and, and, and uncomfortable you know, putting yourself in these uncomfortable situations, whether it's a sales environment. I think life is sales. It's such a valuable skill that folks at your company have because every part of life oh, as a wealthy person is sales. Yeah. I sold my five, I sold my six-year-old on getting in the car this morning. I sold my wife on where we want to go to dinner, or she sold me. And I'm selling every single one of my employees to trust me and mm -hmm. to trust me with their career. I'm, I'm selling my partners to invest with me. I'm selling my vendors to sell to me. I'm selling my customers to buy from me. So you're selling day. your employees to follow you. Um, I agree 100%.
I mean, they're, they're, what have you seen? Is there one thing that you've seen in what sets the kids apart that become killers? Not, not uh, on the surface, no. I, I just was having this conversation over the weekend. Um, I was at a, one of my kids' soccer games. I was just sitting on the sideline getting ready for the game. The guy was asking about hiring and how many people we hire. And, you know, he asked the question everybody. I was like, do you know ahead of time? I was like, nope. Nope. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, you know, what about personality? I was like, oh, we do personality surveys. We have different iterations of questions mm-hmm. that we've basically evolved. You're looking like, for kids that have done a certain amount of things. Yeah, that you but, think but are so, correlated. so people are like, oh, well, you must you must love to hire athletes. I was like, yeah, we love to hire athletes, but there's <laughs> literally ten thousand athletes we hired that were just <laughs> totally not capable of doing this. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a lot of people at this company who who weren't athletes. They weren't the athletes. They weren't football players. They it just wasn't, and so it gets back to you know what I call a mindset, but it's really an internal fortitude. Some people call it grit. Some people call it mental toughness, mm-hmm. and I have not yet figured out how to measure for that. So a lot of people have those things, and they can't make the right decisions. They self sabotage, whether it's past trauma. Yeah. So, so it, the the formula is too complicated for mm-hmm. me to figure out thus far, and maybe one day someone will. I don't think so. Uh, I think um, I, I just. For us, it's like you just got to hire more people. It's odds. We're playing the numbers. So so I, I said, I said, I, it's like Moneyball. And I said, um, we just hire more people. We we give them, we put them all in a good position where they have, mm-hmm. they have training, they have accountability, they have technology, they have mentorship. And they, at the individual level, will ultimately decide if they're going to be successful or not. I can't carry people with me in life. I 100%, 100% agree. I'm not in the one thing that took me a really long time to learn as an entrepreneur is I'm not in the business of changing people. I spent mm-hmm. the first five years of my career, so my, one of my employees was messing up. They were letting me down. They were making bad decisions. They're costing me money, whatever it is. And I would say, I can change them. All I need to do is coach I, them a little bit longer. I, I can make them better. I it's my that. fault. I can do it. And yes, that it is my fault as a business owner. I put them in that position, especially if it's affecting my company. It's mm-hmm. my fault. But nowadays, Look, yes, 20% of people change. Nick, People say, Nick, you're so cruel. What are you talking about? Why will people not change? Of course they change. Yeah, they change, but one in 10 will change. And, and I'm a gambling man, and I I was gonna say I'm not taking those, those odds. odds. I was going to touch on something uh, very much that I've had to learn as it related to, because you talked about uh, earlier, I think it was ego or cockiness. And, and my ego, especially early on in my more mentoring and coaching side of my career in real estate, was I – thought so highly of myself that I said, oh, I can make anyone successful. Mm-hmm. And just over time, I realized <laughs> that arrogance not will get the, beat right out of me. Too. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just it's not the case. And and um, when I had a lot of time to spend on any one person, I certainly could carry them. I certainly could mask the fact that they likely shouldn't be in this business for a long period of time. But at some point, whether it's because personal life, you build family, you spend less time at the office, or in this case, the company gets bigger, I have less one time for any individual. Eventually, that you do have to leave them on their own, and no matter how much momentum you've helped create in their career, no matter how much um, gravity you've created to their career, they, they all fall back down to earth if they aren't that person, if they don't got that dog in them. The spidey sense, I think, is what develops over the years as an operator. Yeah, You, you have that feeling, oh man, this person's just not got what it takes. And of course, six months later, they're gone. Yeah. Every time. My spidey sense now oh, is so good that yeah. as soon as I think, oh, this operator's really struggling, or oh, this sales guy just it's a couple red flags. Oh, we can get through this. Yeah, it might I, work out. You touched on it earlier. Is I think one thing I've learned over the years is um, it's not, it doesn't even have to deal with me changing someone or fixing someone or saying I can make them successful. It's just over the years, and I want to get your opinion on this, I think you just, basically answer the question is once you're like oh this person can't do the job today i hope they change let me just hope let me just maybe if they just give them more time they almost unfailingly never do Mm -hmm. and whether it's six months or six years from now you end up having to make the decision you were kind of avoiding which is in many cases terminating Mm -hmm. and typically the longer you wait the the more destructive that final decision is. I think an entire organization is, it falls to the level of the competence that you tolerate. If you're a business owner that's spineless and you're going to tolerate people not showing up, you're going to tolerate people making poor decisions, you're going to tolerate people lying, you're going to tolerate not workers, not good workers, low work ethic. If you tolerate that, that's going to do two things. It's going to run off your A players 
number one. All your best people are going to be like, fuck this. I'm getting out of here. There's no way I want to work in this. I'm picking up the slack. I got more stress. I got these incompetent people around me. Boom. And number two, over the course of a year, six months, five years, 10 years, your entire company is going to fill with these people. And you're going to have a business that is just full of total incompetence. Yeah, well said. I, I'm going to tweet that, and I'm going to tag you in it, Nick Huger. Um, I asked you this question earlier, and I said uh, I'm going to come back to it. What does, what does money mean to you today? So every, every man has this ego and this drive to change the world. We want to be important. We want to be known. We want to impact others. We want to do philanthropy so that we can pat ourselves on the back. And money is a tool to do that. It amplifies all that. So if I want to impact people, whether it's give people opportunity or I want to give money away to help wherever I can, or if I want to, it's just an unfortunate truth that money rules the world. This world that we live in, money rules it. It, it's, it is what gets things done. So if you want to move mountains, have a big enough checkbook. And so I want, to have a, I want to have enough money that I can influence enough people in the right way. My message will grow. I'll be able to share this sweaty startup mantra. I'll be able to share what I know about real estate, and hopefully I'll be able to change some people's lives. Um, but also, I want to grow. I want to raise kids that can come in and help me and get involved in this family business. They understand where we are. I'm not going to shelter them from money. I'm not one of those guys who says, I'm not going to give my kids any money. Um, I want to raise kids that are competent enough to handle it the right way. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. We'll see. How many kids you got? Three so far, hopefully two or three more. Damn. One of them's right out here in the office. I know. I wonder what he's doing. I, I, I had Sonia put, he has a headset, he has a call list, he's making cold calls. Oh, we got to get a picture of that. He's doing his first day. Yeah. Of, he's six years old. Timothy didn't come with any leads, zero skill, just nobody, like a kid out of college. Nobody at Matthews <laughs> comes with leads. And, and I, I like, wait, what did I say? I make millionaires. No, uh, <laughs> I am putting Timothy in a position to be successful, right? We got to get a picture of that. We'll get a picture. Um, no, I just want to raise good kids that want to spend time with me. I want to build relationships. I want to. I'm an adventurer. I love to play golf. Um, I want to fly around and do fun things with my friends, um, build memories, and I don't know. My ego says I want to be a positive influence on as many people as possible. That's my ego so, talking. So, so like a entrepreneur's coach type thing, or did you see yourself selling? Uh, Selling what do they call selling like going around the country doing space paid speaking engagements and selling, yeah I want to yeah. be a New York Times bestselling author I want to build my personal brand to the next level I want to write a lot of books that are so that sell a lot of copies um, I'll definitely do public speaking I enjoy it it's uncomfortable um, I started business brokerage with my dad it was super mm -hmm. rewarding he t he called me about nine months ago and said Nick I can't handle my job anymore and I said quit and come to work for me it was really amazing and um. We buy and sell companies. We got three listed now, and I think that's going to be a really good business that grows over time. Eventually, I want that to be my own personal private equity division where we are buying some companies. We are doing things as my network grows of operators, and I can buy some companies, grow companies. I think that's super. I just think deal making and growing businesses is very fun. Would, it excites me. If I were to talk to your mom or dad, and I would just say, "Hey, was Nick always like this? Like at seven years old, ten years old, thirteen years old, like?" having this entrepreneurs kind of looking at everything as an opportunity, what, what do you think they would say? I think I've, I've channeled my energy into better, more profitable places now, but I've always been off. I've always loved attention. I was acting out. I acted out. I just did goofy things because I wanted me to make people laugh. I've always wanted people around me to be having more fun than I'm having. Um, now I just kind of channel that into building businesses, but more I'm, I'm definitely different. I, I'm, I was always different, that's for sure. You have three kids, maybe two or three more, God willing. What if your kids aren't like that? What if they don't have that mm -hmm. entrepreneurial go-getter and you're, you're trying to get them excited about the business and they're like, Dad, I don't care about this. I'm going to support them. Absolutely. Just like uh, I'm sure you're, you, your family, everybody wants all the boys to play football, but you're not going to – if they don't want to, it's not a problem. No. I, uh, I hope that I can – I think it's also a numbers game with kids. <laughs> Does that sound bad? Morbid things happen. You lose a kid, God forbid. Um, I'm playing a numbers game with the kids too because I want some that want to hang out with dad when, when they get a little older. I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, what did that? Uh, what, who are the what are the princes? Zach, who are the princes of uh, Charles and Willie? Uh, yeah, no, who who's the, the one that went off into the states with, with the one uh, with the the wife that's uh, always, always got a feeling Henry. hurt, right? I'm pretty sure it's Henry. Charles and Henry. Who's the one with the red hair? 
Yeah, the one that came to the America okay. and married the So so he got he got offended that his dad referred to as like, look, I have an heir and a spare. And he was the spare and he got <laughs> he got he took it personally. <laughs> but uh yeah, you get you you know, you got some heirs, you got some spares. What's his name? Prince Henry. That's Harry, how much that's Harry, how much that's Harry. how much popular culture like I Harry. Give two shits about the <laughs> Prince of Wales. Is that yeah, below, Prince of Wales? Blow my line. Yeah, take this picture. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but uh, oh shit, where was I going with that? Uh, we have more kids because some of them might not want to hang out with us. I'll tell you about my dad. My dad never once, um, as a kid, ever. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. So I'll take the opportunity. I did not play football till high school. Wow. I played soccer. You got no pressure though. No, that I, is amazing. To this day, I go, Dad, how come I didn't play football? He's like, I don't know. You never, you never asked, and you're really good at soccer. So if you could play soccer, so I, I switched to football in high school. And you were a shrimp. You didn't tell. And you. I was tiny. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I was tiny. Luckily, I grew. But um, so <laughs> I asked the question. And so he's like, Yeah, you just, I don't know. You're good at soccer. You, you played soccer. He was so matter of fact about it. There was only one time my dad ever dressed football with me. I, I. Committed to go play football at USC um, in the spring of my senior year of high school because that's around the time you do that. And it was like a couple months later, might even been in the summer. And uh, my my dad and I were driving, and he's you know he's kind of like, hey, you're uh, you're working out right and like conditioning. You gotta get ready for college. It's different. I was like, yeah, yeah, dad, sure. I was not working <laughs> out. I was not. I was partying with my buddies. Oh, it was a rude awakening when I got down there. But again, I had to grow as a person. I had to learn it my own way, the hard way. But he kind of looked at me and he goes, hey, um, you know you don't have to play football because I played, right? I go, yeah, I know that. He goes, all right, cool. That, 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 was, the, awesome. that was the only conversation I ever had with my dad about me playing football. I love asking the parents who were successful in their own right, who raise amazing kids, because there's two ways that this goes. There's the rich kids that turn into entitled jerks and are yeah. worthless. And that's what we're all yeah. afraid of as we have success and we grow businesses. But then there's the kids of wealthy, successful parents who, yeah. who just continue to kick ass. I, I, uh, that's what I want. I don't think I, I – see, I have to do better. You know, our friend, uh, strip mall guy, was giving me a heart. He's like, you need to think about posting because you say these things and they're all great posts, but you don't. I get a ton of content when I'm around you because you just rattle off amazing things and I tweet them later. This is good. I I, <laughs> I, 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 am, I want to put you in a position to be successful. Yeah, yeah. Tag us or something. All right. So listen, is um, oh, damn it. What was I? Yeah. But we were talking about parents who raise great kids. Oh, so I don't think I had posted this shit. Maybe maybe in my mind I was like, oh, this would be a good post. Is when I was younger, let's call it 25, and I was a young broker. Um, I would. You, a lot of rich kids are not driven. They're not successful. They're disasters. They're all the cliche and things that we think they are. But then I would come across um, professionals that I would find out were, you know, as I say, born on third base, right? And yet they were super driven and they were even more motivated and they were total professionals. And even me interacting with them, they were just wonderful people. But I had my own issues and my own insecurities. Like, well, pff, yeah, of course. Like, you know, his dad or his mom or this or that. And as I'm getting older, and I have children, I have four, 13, 10, 6, and 2. And there we go. They they, they, they are growing Can up. Can keep going? No, I'm medically retired. Okay. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. <laughs> we got four wonderful, healthy kids, two mm -hmm. boys, two girls. Everything is, is symmetrical in my life at this point. Um, but I... Uh, as I got older, and especially when I had kids, you realize how hard it is to raise kids. Not when you, I'm not saying it's ever easy, but it's easier to say, I can't. Hey, dad, can I get a pony? Hey, can I, you know, get this? And you're like, oh, I'd love to get it for you, but I can't. It's hard to say I won't. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to say I won't. That's exactly the advice that I get from people who, one guy said it so well as if he'd been thinking about this stuff as well. He said, Nick, the key is you have to teach your kids how to struggle and deal with the consequences of their actions. He said, you're going to have the resources to solve their problems. They get a DUI, they drop their iPhone, they lose their job. You're going to have the power and the influence to make one call and solve that problem for them. Do not do it. Yeah, it's make, very them, make them deal with the consequences of their actions. And then they're going to learn that they can't just do whatever the, I, they want. I agree. And as you know, it's it's harder, you know, it's easier said than done. But and where I, what I was saying was like, as I got older, I realized that it actually is an easier path for that, you know, stereotypical rich kid to kind of be a 
slapdick, someone who just kind of sits mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. and leverages off that. But to have grown up in wealth and grown up with um, means, but then to be driven and to take it another step, which is kind of what I think you were saying is, uh, whatever I build, I want my kids to level yeah, it, level exactly. it up. And so now, over the years, I almost admire the people who grew up. I, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was Lex Fred, and it was Jared Kushner. And Jared Kushner, I don't think he's a, he's only controversial in the sense like he's associated with Donald Trump. But I don't even know who he is. So he's Donald Trump's son-in-law. Okay. He married uh, his daughter Ivanka. Okay. Ivanka. Um, and he was Donald Trump's. Uh, no, Ivanka's the daughter. Ivana. I. It's, People will know what I'm okay, talking so about. Okay, so Kushner's in the Trump family. So yeah, but his dad was a very successful real estate developer in New Jersey. He grew up tremendous wealth, tremendous means. His dad did have some legal issues that he spoke about, but I, it was like a two or two and a half hour podcast. And he we walked through how they got the Abraham Accord signed off when when he he was in Donald Trump's administration. He he talked about their approach to Iran. He talked about their approach to deregulating the economy to 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 increase private business activity. He was so articulate and so well spoken, and I was like, "Man, this guy probably had a path to just being a total jackass, and he's just like leveling up." And I was like, "I was very, very much came away from that interview like, man, that credit to that guy Mm because it's easy when you have because, and again, push back if I'm saying this like it's easy for you and I to say, "Oh, well, our our motivation day one is money," but what if you had? $50 Fifty million dollars staring at you in the face when you were twenty-two. Would mm-hmm. you? Would you have? I'm going to ask you this question. Would you have done everything you've done? My dad definitely would have had to navigate it in a whole different right. way. Yeah. I like to hope that I still would have been driven, and I'm having more fun now than I've ever had in my life. Just doing these deals, influencing with these people, making these relationships. It's so fun. But yeah, would I have done it if I had? I call it Daddy's Amex, you know? I saw kids at college that just had Daddy's Amex. And when they wanted to go skiing, they went to North Face store and they bought $800 worth of shit, and yeah. then they threw it away afterwards almost. That's crazy. I Yeah, I call it scholarship. Like, they're mm-hmm. on forever scholarship. And they're like, what is scholarship? Well, it was scholarship in college when you're playing a sport. Yep. You, have, you have room, you have board, you have food, you have clothes. Like, you kind of have everything you need to have a comfortable life. You may not have, like, crazy amounts of liquid cash at your disposal, but, like, you really don't You don't have any concern or worry that you're not going to have one of the basic needs for survival. Let me put it that way. I have two main fears. Number one is that I will suddenly, or somebody in my family will pass away, me and my kids. I think I, that's normal. I think most I have, As I get more successful, that fear amplifies. And my second one is that I raise crappy kids, and I don't know how to do it. I don't, I'm going to learn a lot. It's going to humble me. I'm sure it's going to humble me. But I just want my kids to understand that their great grandparents came over here with nothing and worked their whole life in a factory so that their grandparents could go to school. And then, their grand, and then those grandparents worked their whole life in a union doing the same thing every day over and over and over again so that our parents could go to a little bit better school. And then our parents worked their butts off their entire lives and put me on a lawnmower. And all of a sudden now I have the opportunity to do a lot more and impact a lot more. That's very powerful. I believe there is a saying that there's every, you know, I don't think it was Freud, but somebody said, uh, like within four generations, every family rises and falls in America. And there's the founder, like the builder, the maintainer and the maintainer and the destroyer. Mm-hmm. You could Google this after. Like there's yep. a very clear four generations. So soft times, Create hard men, yeah, hard men create good that. times, yeah. good times create weak men. Yeah, um, that's a phenomenal quote. Um, but that that's a, is essentially what you're saying you're parenting against. I think life is freaking hard. Life is hard for everybody. It's hard for rich people. It's hard for poor people. Obviously on different ends of the spectrum, different things. But it's, it's not easy. And if you protect your kids from struggle, they're not going to be able to handle it, no matter how rich they are. So... That's where I'm starting. I, I like, I enjoy saying no to my boys when they want something, they can't get it. I kind of like it. It's a, it's a sick thing. I love them. I love on them. I spoil them. We have a lot of adventure. We have a lot of great time together. But when they ask for something, I have absolutely no qualm in saying, hey, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, I, I look to spoil my kids with affection is what I say. Yep, exactly. I don't mind if my kids are spoiled with affection. I walk into my kid's room, Timothy, out there every night and say, hey, uh, do you want me to read you a story, or do you want me to tell you everything I love about you? And he hasn't yet asked for the story. 
Oh, that's very good. He says, I'm tell like, me everything you love about me. And I'll say, I love how fast you are at running. I love how nice you are to your sister, Julia. I love how you listened today when we got out of church and you didn't run to the car. And he just gets proud. And right. Good man. <laughs> good man. I'm going to take that. That's a good one. All right. Let's uh, let's start wrapping this up. Um, this is a good one, man. We had a lot of... This is good. Uh, we could get going. I'm worried. It's like, what if your kids got to go to the bathroom or something? Sonia? <laughs> ah, she can handle that. All right. Does she have, did she have kids? No, but I think she'll, she'll be fine. <laughs> she'll be fine. She's, she has a lot of she has a lot of nieces and the lady who and, welcomed yeah. me when I walked in said I can help too because I was a church pastor for or a, ch- a children's church pastor for six years or something. So your children's church pastor yeah, that's, that's God's work. You can do anything. <laughs> exactly. How would you want someone to describe Nick Huber? I would like them to say that I am not afraid to take risks that I get stuff done, that I've helped a lot of people, and that uh, I don't care as much about what people think. Is and that, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to be myself. And is that why do you think someone might say, oh, Nick's controversial? I just, have a, I just have a weird sense of humor. Like, a lot of what I do on Twitter, people overthink it. I just, I'm a pick. Like, I, I, I like uh, the fact that I can tweet something and make... 400,000 people on the internet angry like that doesn't that doesn't resonate with me like in in what world are you walking around doing whatever you want like you have the world is at your wish you live in America most of these people you can do anything you want to do and you're electing to get angry at what Nick Huber says who you never met who you don't have to follow you're electing to get angry about something yeah. that he says that just doesn't make any sense to me so I can't help but pick on those people um, but yeah also I have a lot of controversial opinions on where to live, how to raise kids, um, the fact that you shouldn't do what you love in business. You should do where the opportunity presents itself and then spend the damn money doing what you love later. Uh, um, yeah, I'll um, to that. Yeah. Uh, too many kids think, oh, I'm going to go start X, Y, and Z business because Follow I love it. Follow your passion. That's the worst advice that I've ever well, heard in my life. Well, I just tell people, like, more than anything, do you have a passion for being successful? And they're like, yeah. It's like, then do something you'll actually be successful in. Turns out if you get rich by 35, yeah. you can have a lot of fun doing yeah. whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that Tosh.0 oh skit. He's like, you know, they say money doesn't buy you happiness, but man, you ever seen someone on a jet ski sad? It's never happened. <laughs> seen you know, like they're, all, yeah, they're, they're, they're always having a great time. It, it was a skit. It's, it never left me, but um, but I got you. And uh, what what would you want your legacy to be when you, you I know you're going to say, I never will, but when you hang up your cleats, when you're, no, if I die, to, done, if I if when, I draw, when, if I die tomorrow, when you retire from working five hours a week, okay, that was um, a joke. Every man wants recognition. Every man wants people to think, "Damn, he was a badass." I would be lying to you if I said that I didn't care what people think, because everybody cares what people think. Just who and yourself and your parents or whoever you're trying to impress in this world. But yeah, man, I wanna I wanna do a lot of really big things. And I think I'm just getting started. But if I die tomorrow and I'm driving home and I pass away, I don't want anybody to be sad because I had a lot of fun. And hopefully the message can keep getting out there. You have every day, day day-to-day experience across multiple industries now for multiple companies Mm -hmm. in multiple industries. What has you seen been the biggest driver of those who went on to be successful? What is the most common trait you've, you've seen? I think half of it is being in a good business. I think being in a good business trumps being good at business. <laughs> it's way, way easier to make money in self-storage than it was moving boxes in a moving company. Um, but yeah, I think it's the people that are delaying gratification. You said it. Just If you are willing to do what's not fun today and put aside what you care about, people walk around the world very selfishly. Hey, what can you do for me? They network with their hand out. Hey, help me, help me, help me. Oh, what can this do for me? What what job gives me the best work-life balance? Where do I get the most vacation days? How do I make the most money? Oh, I'll switch jobs for an extra little bit of money because it's all me, 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 me. If you can put all that aside and say, hey, what do other people need? What are, what are rich people, what are problems they're having that I can solve? How can I change these things? You can do really freaking well. If you put your own ego aside and you start businesses based on opportunity and where opportunities are. You can, you can do really, really well. And how do you find these opportunities? Is it just, hey, everybody open your eyes and just look at everything around you from that lens? Like, Yeah. How? Entrepreneurs watch Shark Tank and they hang out on you know TechCrunch and they hang out on Twitter 
and they're thinking they're in their own little bubble about how they can start a technology company, shut your laptop, go outside, and start walking around the world with a curious mind. Hey, how does that business make money? Oh, we're in this restaurant. They're paying four grand a month of, of you know rent. They have you know six grand a month of overhead with the three chefs in the back. They have um, utilities. They have electric. They have 17 tables in here. They're going to send out food at 20% margin. How is this place making money? How many customers do they need to have to make money? Start thinking like that everywhere you go in the world, and boom, you're going to stumble upon, damn, this is a good business. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you'll be doing cost segs. That's right. <laughs> Everybody should be doing cost segs. <laughs> um, what about that question in reverse, in, in your experience, having come across thousands of people that you've managed, hired, fired, partnered with, invested, had invest? What, what do you think has been the biggest consistent theme and why someone doesn't achieve success insecurity what is it like how whether so? they whether they voice it or not i think insecure people many many insecure people act they're overcompensating the other way they're acting very sure of themselves but then they end up taking a venture capital bet because if they fail the odds were that they would fail there's no ownership if you go start a business where almost everybody wins and you fail guess what that's scary. Mm -hmm. How many self-storage guys have you heard going broke in the world? <laughs> I'm taking a pretty big risk doing that because if I fail, there's nobody to blame but me. But if I go start a venture capital business, back business and try to change the world, of course I wasn't going to win. Nobody's ever done that before. What did I expect? Yeah, only one no, out of 30. Nobody can yeah. blame me. So I think it's kind of sometimes raising VC money and trying to change the world and having these you know, hair game, hair, hair brained business ideas, that's a cop-out. Yeah, it's not your money anyway. Yeah, so... Play the odds. Be confident. More people should be confident. More people should have a big ego. More people should try to be the big fish in the in a small pond. Let and me go, go start the momentum. I going. want to add to that because this is something you had touched on, and I meant to ask this question earlier. But one of the, I'll, I'll say the biggest reason, answering my own question, that I've seen people not achieve success in the businesses that I've been involved with, mostly real estate, but even athletics is victim mentality mm -hmm. is feeling like you're a victim you're being victimized nothing's in your control it's somebody's doing something yep. to you yep. in brokerage it's like oh it's the market it's mm -hmm. my product type it's my it's my geographic focus in in sports like uh it's, it's my, the car my, ride my, home it's the my, car my ride my home coach, with the dad yeah, who my, was saying these referees screwed us yeah my coach doesn't like me it's all mm -hmm. politics yep. um at USC, I came in under a previous coach, Paul Hackett, and he, he, was, he was let go after my freshman. Pete Carroll comes in, and I had all my teammates that I came in with in my class, and so many of them, when Pete came in, he's like, oh, you know, I'm not playing because Pete wants his guys. It's like, no, he just wants the best player. It, maybe his guys are better, but... Um, I'm never, ever, you, ever, ever going to blame a referee in front of my kids. I'm never going to blame a coach in front of my kids. I'm never going to blame a teacher in front of my kids. Every single thing that goes wrong, and of course a referee is going to blow a call. Yep. Every single thing that goes wrong on the ride home, I'm going to be like, hey, that's the name of the game. Sometimes that's how it happens. Or I'm going to say, hey, we could have put ourselves in a better position to make this happen. Yeah, don't let the refs decide it. Um, and part of the reason I asked that is because I think in a previous interview you had said maybe early on you did have a little victim mentality as a business owner. 100%. I was pointing at the labor market. I was pointing at how nobody wants to work hard. I was pointing... Fingers was everywhere. during the storage, student, storage, yeah. student storage business, 2012, me and Danny sitting in a bar in Ithaca, New York, and just, just complaining. Just like this, we're right across from each other, and I'd say, dude, did you see how dumb that employee was? Look at this over here. Or, gosh, this cus these customers are just entitled. They're mean. Or the labor market. Or we can't lease any warehouse space because the real estate market. And we were just pointing fingers at everybody. And eventually, we, we just said, hey, get it together. It's our fault. But, okay, so but, but how did that happen? Because most my experience or my opinion, and I'll state as opinion, is I argue that it's a fact is most people never get out of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, look look at how people vote. It's politicians get voted in based on who's better at blaming someone else. Like it seems like almost, and that's yeah. Republican and Democrat both basically say, hey, this other person is doing this to you. Vote for me and I'll protect you because you're a victim. Yeah. How did you not go down that victim route, even though you, you, you had that mentality, it sounds like, in that moment. Like, you're like blaming, ah, these employees mm -hmm. suck, the market sucks, these customers suck. What happened? We saw one of our competitors sell. And they were bigger, they were better, and they, the owners got rich. A couple million bucks. And we're like, damn, they did it. 
And then we're like, okay, if they can do it, we can do it. We have no excuse here. Okay. And then I realized when I went into a Texas Roadhouse right across the street from our warehouse, and it was full of people, had 125 full time employees in the same market we were trying to hire 10 people. Like, okay, they can hire 125 people to cook food and haul it out. We got to stop blaming the labor market. It's not the labor market, it's us. And as soon as we said, if our employees make, make a mistake, it's our fault. If we can't get enough employees, it's our fault. If we can't find a warehouse, it's our fault. As soon as we started saying that stuff, we got a lot better quicker. It's amazing how that happens. It is. That's, that's what I was saying. I said, um, that, that's been my biggest eye opener when, you know, somebody asks like, okay, why didn't so-and-so make it? Why didn't he make it? Why didn't she make it? I was like, generally speaking, it's victim mentality. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, I couldn't, or we as a company or leader, I just wasn't effective enough communicating that over a long enough period of time, the outcome of success is totally in their control. I mean, we're, we're taught it all over society. I mean, look at the way San Francisco treats people who couldn't hack it in America. Like, yeah. it's not their fault. We just got to help them. We got to help them. We got to help them. We got to help them. It turns out the more they help them, the more homeless people pile up in the city. It's the same way as a business owner. The more you blame your problems on somebody else, the more problems pile up. They, uh, they did just clean up San Francisco. I think a President Xi from uh, China came in, and in one day they cleaned everything up. And Gavin Newsom, uh, he was the governor when I left California. He, uh, somebody who asked, asked him the question, like, yeah, I know. I know a lot of people are going to say we cleaned up the city because, like, there are all these important people. And it's true because it's true. And they was like, wait, what? You, you know, so I thought that was pretty funny. It's entitlement as well. I mean, oh, yeah. people who are born in America feel entitled to a good life when in reality the world, the history of the world has never been free of suffering for any society ever. Life's hard. It's hard. It's hard to stay away from addictions. It's hard to keep your relationships. It's hard to not be selfish. It's hard to not spend all your money. It's hard to... You know, everything in life's hard. So if you <laughs> if you can't handle that, then you're not going to do well. That's right. And self-storage is hard, baby. <laughs> right now. You just got to wait. wait it out. Yeah. It's no, it's no such thing as pencils down. We're still... No. We're working. Pricing's breaking. Sellers are moving down. Um, I am a... Well, let me get a little real estate in here, actually. Where uh, where do you see interest rates going over the next twelve months? Uh, they got to go down. Yeah, um, maybe not over the next twelve months, but if they stay here for another twelve months, I think there's going to be total chaos, which I guess is good for an entrepreneur. Change is good. It, it's one of those things where we say it in our meetings: hurts us, but it hurts them worse. That, that's right. <laughs> do you guys say that? Yeah, that's what we say here. <laughs> like it hurts us, it kills them. Yeah, it's like a market chemotherapy. Yeah, like every day that we. Weather this storm, three more acquisitions, guys get fired. This is true. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in. They go get different jobs. Yeah, you. Our, we're in the brokerage business. We see the amount of brokers are competitors of the public competitors. They have to tell us every quarter, and it just keeps going down. <sighs> it's going to outlast them. Yeah. We'll see. It's definitely not an exciting, fun time to be in the real estate business, but I think that's when it's the most critical to be serious about real estate. I'm not trying to age you on this, but when I was – an agent during the global financial crisis. It, I had that, like, this sucks, this is terrible. And it just looking back was the best thing that ever happened to me. And it was the best thing that ever happened to a lot of professionals and companies because it, it weeded out a lot of the, the the competitors that in a good market can be competitive, but in a bad market, they go away. Yeah, operators, it's been easy to operate self-storage. Yeah. It's been easy. And now it's not easy. We have operational headwinds. We have acquisition headwinds. Um, but we'll, I like I like it. You'll I'm get excited. better as a leader. You'll get better as an organization. You know, mm -hmm. necessity is the mother of all invention, and, and these markets necessitate getting better, getting leaner, getting more efficient, mm -hmm. having better strategy, or you know, just people doing more, whatever it is. And um, you know, you just got to keep moving forward and not let this market end you, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, it does feel good to be diversified, making a little bit of money from a business of, perspective. Yeah, it, making a little bit of money outside of real estate makes me sleep better. At that night. is good. Have you thought about diversifying within real estate, like multifamily? Yeah, we're, we, we're going to buy an industrial building, small one in Athens here coming up. Uh, we'll keep looking for those. We're opportunists. I'm getting more and more confident in my ability to do multiple things. And through Twitter, do you have any issues fundraising anymore? I haven't tried going out for money really this year, so I don't know. We'll see. I'm nervous about it for sure. Do you see yourself next year, like, as you think the market's maybe coming back to you, is raising some sort of fund? No. Or do, or do you just do deal, each yeah. deal individually? Yep. I want to be my own LP. My goal is to be making enough money personally where I don't need a lot of outside capital. Yeah. I can stroke a lot of my own cash into deals, and I can keep buying 
50 million a year and do really well that way instead of having to buy 100 or 200 or really, really, really go big. But if it makes sense to go really big, I'm not afraid of that. How old are you? 34. Man, you got time, man. Young, young, young gun. Uh, what advice would you have for listeners personally or professionally to achieve what it is they think they want in life? Well, if you want wealth, if you just want a normal life, look, it, it's not hard to get that in America. Just go get a decent job, clock in, clock out, go home, watch Netflix at 5 o'clock, do whatever you want all weekend. That's a pretty good life for a lot of people. Chase your hobbies, do whatever. But if you want to get rich, find an organization of chaos. Find a, a leader, an owner of a company who wants growth and is intense and is willing to take risk and find a company that's really growing. And that's when the best people get promoted. You don't get promoted based on tenure or how long you've been sitting at a desk. You get promoted from competence and you're able to solve dynamic problems and get you know, a different kind of experience, a more valuable level. That experience. sounds like Matthews, baby. It is. It really is. We didn't even role play that before this interview. Well done, Nick. Um, what? Give us a, I always like to kind of end more or less with this question, like give the audience uh, just one resource that has helped you over the year, over the years. And, and I always kind of lead, it could be a book, it could be a series, it could mm -hmm. be something that you can point to like, hey, go do this, this helped me. Yeah, I... I'm a fan of books. I like Entre Leadership by Dave Ramsey. He lives right here in Nashville. That's a great book. A lot of street smart wisdom what on leading What was the title people. again? Entre Leadership. How do you spell it? E-N-T-R. And then leadership. Entre, you know, entrepreneur. I leadership. got it. I think there's an E, Entre Leadership. But yeah, so it's about being an entrepreneurial leader, growth. And, and look, you can be an entrepreneur inside of a company. You can delegate inside of a company. You don't have to run your own company to hire and lead other people. You can make amazing money in life being good at your job. If you're good at your job, you can make great money. But when you stop working, you stop getting paid. If you're good at making other people good at their job, you can get very, very wealthy, even for a boss and even for an owner of a company. What would one piece of advice you'd give your younger self, having learned what you've learned over the years? Um, delegate more. If you have a job inside your company, you're the bottleneck and the problems will pile up quick. Um, I used to think that when I was driving my truck, I was saving myself $20 an hour because I didn't have to pay somebody $20 an hour to drive a truck. That was the wrong mindset. What would your retort or your response be if someone said, well, if I delegate everything, they're going to say, well, what do I need you for? Yeah, um, that's a, everybody thinks, hey, if I delegate myself out of a job, they're going to let me go. And that's so far from the truth. That's when you get even more valuable. You become very, very valuable to an owner and to an organization when you can lead other people and manage other people. Because delegation is a foreign concept for almost everybody. We're never given a, a high school homework assignment and the teachers say, hey, why don't you go find a freshman to do this homework for you? We're never showing up to football practice at USC saying, hey, we got to do all these wind sprints. We got to do all these reps. We got to watch all this game tape. Why don't you go find somebody else to sit in here and do this for you while you go do whatever you want? Mm -hmm. Delegation is a foreign concept. It's trained in every American to comply and do what they're told and follow the leaders. So nobody has any practice at it. And it's super uncomfortable. The first hire is super scary. But if you can develop it and if you can get better at leading other people, you can get really, really rich. I love it. And I think most people do want to get really, really rich. And those who say they don't, they're lying. I agree. <laughs> Deep thoughts by Kyle Matthews. Um, all right, Nick, this has been a blast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by on your way from Leopold, Indiana, bow hunting for two weeks on your way back to Athens, Georgia. I'm going to have to come down and see a Bulldog game. They're, Let's do it. They're number one We're right looking now, right? good, yeah. Our, our quarterback, Carson Beck's coming into his own. He's doing really well. And Who do you guys play this week? We're done. We played Tennessee. We got Georgia Tech and then Alabama and the SEC oh, we're championship. We're done. <laughs> we do have to play Georgia Tech. But, yeah, you guys will beat them. Where's the national championship this year? Uh, I, Is I it don't Vegas? Know. Might be. Might be. Okay. I don't know. We play Alabama and the SEC championship. That's what we're focused on. That will be a good but game. But it's really fun living in Athens. It's a great low-cost of living town. Um, do you see yourself being there? Home base, yeah. The, the problem kids? with Athens is the airport. You're an hour yeah. and a half from Atlanta Airport, but if I can make enough money, that, that problem can be solved. I am about to say, I, you know, yes, I, we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> Nick, it's great to see you. Thanks I look for forward to me, seeing man. you again soon. Appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yep.